times to our Sahayas and for the rest of us, a pleasant good morning. We are now on our fifth day of our ULP 2021 and it's going to be a busy and nutritious day. It is really going to be exciting to open this workshop day. We have in store some very interesting topics from one of our constituent universities of UP. We are joined by the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. And Dr. Tonette P. Laude is our cluster host. Thank you for your kind introductions. I am very happy to be part of this important program and welcome to our participants from around the globe. I am very for we are very fortunate to have the Chancellor of UP Los Baños on board with us on this initiative. And although he cannot join us live today, let us all listen to Dr. Jose V. Camacho Jr. as he formally welcomes our dear undergraduate leaders. To all of the participating student leaders from the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, a warm virtual welcome to the University of the Philippines Los Baños for this workshop on ensuring food security through sustainable production and good nutrition. UPLB is delighted to facilitate this workshop as part of the APRU the Undergraduate Leaders Program 2021. We are glad to showcase our technologies and concepts on food production and food technology and human nutrition. UPLB is active in research and public service engagements. And these include a significant number about food and nutrition security in our quest to catalyze and enhance the development of our communities. But we recognize that despite the numerous achievements worldwide in agricultural science and technology, hunger and malnutrition in various forms remain as one of the world's greatest challenges. In fact, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, we are experiencing a global syndemic or a synergy of pandemics that co-occur in time and place, interact with each other, and share common underlying drivers such as food, transport, urban design, and land use systems. Now, these pandemics, which by the way, have nothing to do with the current COVID-19 pandemic that we are experiencing, refer to what FAO calls as interacting pandemics, which include obesity, undernutrition, and climate change. Many countries around the world are experiencing an unprecedented increase in undernutrition, obesity, and diet-related non-communicable diseases. These problems are especially felt in low- and middle-income countries. One of the reasons for such increase is the prevalence of low quality diets consisting of foods rich in refined carbohydrates, salt, fat, and sugar. Such food products have become more widely accessible compared to fresh fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, and whole grains. While there are many factors contributing to the accessibility and affordability of unhealthy food products over healthy ones, there is a broad consensus that food systems play a fundamental role in determining the quality of diets and in influencing what consumers choose to eat. As young leaders, it is important that you understand that the need to address food and nutrition security in our region is critical, imperative, and urgent. Despite the many difficulties that come with achieving a food and nutrition secure region, I am optimistic that we can find sound and sustainable solutions to address this challenge. And I hope that this workshop at UPLB could serve as an inspiration. 
at this point. I would like to thank APRU for choosing UPLB to facilitate this workshop. This is an undertaking that further strengthens our global engagement toward a future-proof UPLB. I would also like to commend our organizers from UPLB, led by Office of International Linkages Director Ana Floresca Fermalino, together with the team from the Office of Public Relations, led by Director Mark Lester Chico, and our experts from the College of Agriculture and Food Science and the Institute of Human Nutrition and Food for their commitment to stage this important activity. I encourage everyone to actively participate in today's workshop and together we explore ways on how you as youth leaders can take part in helping address food and nutrition security. I wish all of you an insightful, inspiring workshop. Thank you and stay safe. Babuhay tayo lahat. Thank you very much, Chancellor Camacho, for that inspiring and warm welcome. We will surely use your words of wisdom to further our goals in ULP 2021 and take in mind always note of your optimism. Thank you, Chancellor. And to inspire us to be as a haya and ensure that light and hope guides us over our challenges, we are joined today by one of our alumni. He is an advocate for mainstreaming youth engagement across food systems processes, as well as digital agriculture. He finished BS Agriculture major in Agricultural Systems and is doing his MS in Development Management and Governance, both at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He serves as a board member to the Professional Organization for Agriculturists in the Philippines, the Philippine Association for Agriculturists, PAA, and also the Science Policy Think Tank that hosts national scientists and national academicians in agriculture and related sciences, the Coalition for Agriculture Modernization in the Philippines camp. Let us all welcome our alumnus, Mr. Jim Cano. Jim, good morning. Good morning, Antoinette. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. And uh, thank you to UPLB and to the UP system and to APRU for the opportunity to share some um, experiences that I've had for the past years after um, finishing my undergrad in, in progressing into the career that I have now in agriculture. And to go into that, I would just like to start off with this. The title basically is a, a proposition on how we can change the narrative and the mindset and framework on how we look at agriculture as a whole. In, in the goals of ensuring food security or even sustainable food systems for that matter. And the question really that comes next to that is the daily question that people have um, when they you know, lead their lives is that who eats daily, right? And that is the reason, the very reason, or at least the cornerstone on why uh, agriculture remains to be crucial, remains to be critical, remains to be important in the lifestyle, in the life of, of people, especially in, in the context of the pandemic and even post pandemic, post COVID-19, we've seen that food security is one of the biggest um, challenges that, that countries and economies have faced in the past years, past two years specifically. And so we highlight the role of agriculture in that context and in that kind of um, environment that we live in now. And going again to the question of why agriculture, and we see, and, and Dr. Camacho has already um, alluded to some of the issues around food systems, such as the triple burden of malnutrition. Uh, and the FAO also reports, you know, the food waste and food losses that, that take place around the world. And we've seen also in the context of many countries that prices have, have been volatile and have been very, uh, have fluctuated, especially in the context of the pandemic. And even after the pandemic, we will see the, the fluctuation of prices as supply and demand um, is, is heavily impacted by the effects of lockdowns and even the, the need to up 
level up the biosafety protocols in the production systems and even across food supply chains. Beyond that, we look at why agriculture is very crucial and basically going back to the simple Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or at least this illustration, we see at the bottom that the that food is a basic necessity and it's a physiological need that people um, have to achieve before they go through the levels of, of the hierarchy of needs that Maslow um, proposed, uh, at least posits here, which leads to self-actualization of a person. And food security thus then remains to be a very crucial part of people's lives. Now, going again further, why agriculture is very crucial, especially in the context of, uh, at least from the report of the State of Food Insecurity Report, we see that one in three people do not have access to adequate food. And that is a, an, a, a challenge that economies will have to uh, face and address in a, in a very multi-stakeholder partnership approach or in a systems approach, as well as in the in the um, aspect of hunger and poverty, we've seen that lots of people have faced that, especially in 2020, during the peak of the pandemic, we've seen that between 720 and 800 million people um, faced hunger in 2020. This was based on the SOFI report in 2021. And globally, we've seen a decline or at least an aging population rather across uh, the farming populations of different countries and economies. And, and it varies from country to country. In the Philippines, the average age of farmers would be 57 to 59. And so there is really this challenge wherein you um, and I, young people, have a crucial role to play in, in bringing agriculture back to the picture and really highlighting the value and, and bringing our, innovative, uh, our innovation, our creative minds into this field and sector, which is very important. Now, in the report that we wrote, um, I was blessed enough to be part of the high-level panel of experts of the UN Committee on World Food Security, where we published uh, a report on how uh, promoting youth engagement and employment in food systems. And this was launched just this October, uh, two weeks ago, in the Committee on World Food Security. And in this uh, framework that we, we, we wrote, we, we highlighted that the, the four pillars of youth engagement and youth employment in food systems are agency, equity, rights, and recognition. And these are very crucial for young people to be able to um, find employment, um, access resources, access knowledge, and access innovation. And as you would see this yellow spiral, this would represent basically the dynamic and pluriactive role of young people in agriculture. What do I mean? It means that young people are very mobile, very dynamic, in that they can do a lot and wear a lot of hats in, at different times across their life course of being a young person. Um, and when I say being a young person, that, that's basically because in different con countries and different contexts and different cultural uh, setups, the definition of youth varies a lot. You know, it could be based on age. It could be based on civil status. It could be based on a, uh, a specific achievement of educational level or even um, independency in terms of financial stability. And so through that life course of young people, they go through and achieving and hoping to achieve their aspirations um, and interacting with different generations, going through all these different steps. And overall, at the, at the big picture, we, we see that young people have that role in achieving food systems, uh, sustainable food systems, in, in which that would lead to sustainable development goals. And that, of course, leads to the outcomes of economies of well-being, where young people have dignified livelihoods and live in healthy environments and have food sovereignty, meaning young people have the right to determine the kind of food system that they live in. Now, here comes the, the title a while ago, right? Agriculture is perfect. And I borrow this basically from my, my friend and colleague from South Africa, Dr. Khlami Huenya, which basically created, who, who basically created this framework of agriculture being perfect. And perfect uh, means the following. 
agriculture stands uh, or at least is represented in policy. Agriculture is also seen in a different aspect of education or the academe, the academia. It could also be research. Oops. Could be in policy, in education, in research, and it could be in finance or farming or fisheries. It could be an extension in rural advisory services or entrepreneurship. And C, it could be in communications or ICT. And T could also be technology and trade, meaning when we talk about agriculture, it's not only farming, it's not only production, but it's basically all of these different aspects, facets, and perspectives of agriculture that need to be incorporated. And so when we look at how young people, you and I, can be engaged, can be employed, in agriculture and food systems, we have to see it from this mindset instead of just relinking agriculture to production only. And to illustrate that even further, I, I go on to show you know the agri a basic model of an agricultural value chain, where you have the the production uh, system followed by the harvest of of the produce, the the crops or the livestock. And then you have the post-harvest. You have the post-harvest side. Then you have the marketing. And then the processing, marketing, even further, uh, like, you know, distribution through retail, supermarkets, and all these outlets. And then the consumption. And so where does perfect agriculture fall into this model? And this is just a, for example, uh, for the discussion purposes, but it's not limited to, right? Academe research and extension can contribute significantly to you know, the production um, techniques and methodologies uh, and, and the ways to optimize the production systems. How do we optimize harvest and post-harvest? And in fact, uh, as you will go through the discussions throughout the day, you will be able to learn more in-depth um, uh, technologies and scientific knowledge that highlight the different aspects of the agricultural value chain. And when you go into the when you go into the business side of it, agricultural entrepreneurs can come in and and actually go into these different um, aspects. If you have a farm, then you can go into the production or you could also go and uh, buy, buy from farmers at the at the farm gate. And then you go through the marketing aspect or even go through the processing of these products. Of which technologies from food technologists and food scientists also come into play in this aspect of in this part of the value chain in the processing. And, and this is again just uh, for illustration purposes, but not limited. Meaning, if you're a food technologist, it doesn't mean you're only um, limited to that, but you can basically go into the different components of agricultural value chains. Same with the other um, uh, perspectives or career uh, progressions that you would see in agriculture. Again, in agriculture entrepreneurship can come in there. And of course, policy really uh, has that impact across whole food systems, meaning policies at the national or it, even at the local level can determine how, how much imports or how much export can be uh, done by a specific locality or by a country in itself. And also even limiting certain imports to, uh, you know, to meet certain standards or requirements, or even the, the policies on support for farmers, support for young people to, to go into and venture into agricultural businesses, or even have um, youth-friendly financial instruments that they could access to, like zero collateral or zero zero interest for x number of years or um no collateral for loans or uh, for loans that young people could avail of meaning policy has that creates this policy environment in which agricultural value chains uh exist in and are very uh reliant on and so this is an example of where young people you and i can come in and you find your own skills and interests and you zone in and hone in on different aspects of the, of the value chain that you are inclined to. 
And so don't be limited by the kind of um, field that you are, at least the major that you're focusing in on now, but be willing to explore also how far you can go and contribute to food systems development. When I spoke uh, to a, a senior officer of FAO at, in Rome back in 2018, you know, she said that agriculture can address almost 60 to 70% of the sustainable development goals. And we have 17 sustainable development goals and agriculture can address, um, you know, we have practices on addressing mitigating climate change impacts. We have ways in which agriculture employment can increase, um, uh, you know, gender equality or youth empowerment or also addressing hunger and poverty, meaning agriculture and food systems and the activities in which agricultural value chains focus in on can actually address the different sustainable development goals that we have. Now, when we think about going into agriculture, we also see, of course, the different fields that agriculture has, meaning agribusiness, agriculture economics, extension, agricultural systems, agronomy, um, animal science, entomology, horticulture, landscape agroforestry, plant pathology, soil science, and you have all these different fields that you could go into to develop and to progress in your uh, careers down the line in agriculture. And so, yeah, so this is me basically, um, I'm flying a drone over an okra farm. And the, the motto, at least for me, the motivation on why I went into agriculture was that if I know the science behind it, I can easily do business around agriculture. And uh, because there are a lot of opportunities, but you don't have to be limited to entrepreneurship alone. You know, if you're a young person that is very much interested in, in genetics and in research, then you can definitely go into these um, different fields and go into developing plant uh, varieties or breed uh, plant breeding or you know, uh, developing feed additives for or feed supplements for 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 animals, uh, or even go in different aspects of agriculture. So there is a breadth and a wide range of opportunities for young people and to participate, to engage, and to be employed in agriculture. So with uh, taking into consideration the time, of course, for today. Um, I will just share very quickly, you know, what, have, what are the fruits that I have reaped over the past years um, as I progressed uh, in my agriculture profession? So, you know, I started off really with a policy advocacy work um, in 2015 with YPART, Young Professionals for Agriculture Development. So this was us in, in China. We were talking about, you know, um, young people engagement in agriculture and food systems. Um, this was me uh, giving a keynote speech in South Africa during the GCARD 3, our global conference on agriculture research and development, where there were two director generals of CGIAR institutions there. Um, this was me speaking on agriculture extension in Australia during the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services um, annual meeting. And uh, from that Australia meeting, we went on to create a youth working group for agriculture extensionists. And so we had this meeting in Korea to jumpstart that discussion and also the working group. And then I also got invited to, this was my first engagement with the UN Committee on World Food Security in 2018, where I was invited by the private sector mechanism to speak on uh, engagement, how youth can be engaged retained and, and attracted to agriculture. And going further, the following year, I got invited by the International Fund for Agricultural Development or IFAD, also another UN agency on food. And uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to share the same stage where the Pope also spoke. And we, we were basically talking about um, financial instruments that young people should have and have access to. Uh, in agriculture professions. And also on uh, the policy advocacy side, I also chair the Youth Alliance for Zero Hunger, which is an international alliance of young youth in ag networks that focus on uh, engaging with the Rome-based agencies or the UN food agencies. Last October 5, we engaged with the independent chair of the FAO Council 
during the World Food Forum, and we were given a commitment that young people will have a seat at the FAO Council, meaning at the po highest policymaking level of, of the FAO, um, young people will now be heard, and that's a very uh, promising step. So yeah, I was also part of the high-level panel of experts as a co-author among seven authors for this report, which was launched this year. And on the professional side here in the Philippines, I serve as the board member at PAA, uh, Philippine Association of Agriculturists, and also a board member at CAMP, Coalition for Agriculture Modernization of the Philippines, where we have national scientists like Dr. Emil Javier, um, and also Dr. Dolores Ramirez, Dr. Ricardo Lantican, and also other national academicians and industry leaders. And so I've ventured into the, the business aspect now of agriculture, and now I serve as the director for Agritech. We're working on IT solutions for agriculture, and we're rolling out a farm management solution soon, which is called Aggregate. And we've partnered with GS1 Philippines, which is the international uh, organization that does the barcoding for all the products that you see. And we're working on food trace, which will be a traceability solution for food and agricultural products. So these are other business engagements that I have. 360PH is a personal business working on drone imagery and virtual tours. I serve as VP for operations at Dream Agritech, which is a farm consultancy services. And I serve as a mentor at Go Negosho for digital marketing and agricultural supply value chains. And Go Eden is an e-commerce platform for agricultural inputs. So with all of those, what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to be limited and you don't have to see agriculture from a, from a four-wall perspective. That back then in the past years, I know where you are at, that you were as an undergrad, you see that this is the school, this is the course, this is the curriculum, but be willing to explore and go beyond whatever the four walls are because there is so much opportunity for you to contribute creatively and to innovate in agriculture. So my encouragement is that together, let's change the world. Let's pursue a perfect career in agriculture. And with that, again, I thank you, UPLB and our uh, APRU and the UP system for this opportunity to share my experiences on agriculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jim, for that inspiring message. Let us all together take part and change our world. Let us, in our own perfect way, be engaged in agriculture. That was indeed very inspiring. Jim's snack for agribusiness initially caused him to venture into oyster mushroom farming before embarking on his graduate studies and be more engaged with his other advocacy. Uh, Jim strongly believes that the system's perspective is the key to sustainable agricultural development, as well as bringing youth back into the global agriculture. Our cooperation is one fundamental key to ensure that we achieve the United Nations sustainable goals. Yes, indeed, Wendell. This additional information will arm us to better serve our people in our fight against hunger. Let me now present the certificates of appreciation to our first two speakers. This Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Dr. Jose V. Camacho, Jr. We would also like to extend our appreciation for, his, for sharing his expertise and time. Thank you very much, Mr. Jim Cano, Board Member of the Philippine Association of Agriculturists, or PAA. Thank you. Let us now proceed with the very first topic of our session today. Let me call on Dr. Laude. Dr. Laude, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Director Aimee and AVP Wendell. Our participants are in for a treat, a very helpful and nutritious treat for today. The UPLB team has prepared a range of topics for everyone's appreciation of farm-to-table activities and the youth's role in responding to the SDG on ensuring food and nutrition security. To start off, let us all welcome the faculty and researchers from the PGR team who will help us discover the Philippines, one vegetable at a time. The team is led by Professor Teresita H. Borromeo, and she is joined by Assistant Professor Renario P. Gentalian, Jr., 
Ms. Heidelisa D. De Chavez, Assistant Professor Mark Ian Kalayugan, Dr. Lorna Sister, Dr. Leia Endonella, and Mr. Cedric Bartolome. Okay, so PGR team, the floor is yours. Every box shows up at my doorstep. It's one of those subscription boxes, except instead of dog toys or makeup, it's food from local farmers. And I never know exactly what I'm gonna get. Got some salad greens, asparagus, and red corn? That's weird. But this wasn't always such an unusual sight. If you look through old seed catalogs like these ones, you'll see hundreds of varieties of corn with names like Dibble's Mammoth, Kendall's Early Giant, and my personal favorite, Potter's Excelsior. But none of these varieties exist anymore. American farmers used to grow hundreds of varieties of sweet corn, tomatoes, and other edible plants. Today, just a tiny fraction of those varieties are still around. So what happened to all these plants? For most of our time on this planet, humans have been hunter-gatherers. We ate what was nearby. This was still true when we invented farming 10,000 years ago by cultivating wild plants like teosinte in Central America, in thorn apple in Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Over thousands of years, farmers bred these wild ancestors into foods like corn and eggplant that we would recognize today. As humans moved around the world, so did the seeds, and farmers continued to breed different varieties to adapt them to their new environments, which led to a ton of genetic diversity. Farmers could raise different genetic varieties of different crops. If disease or pests killed one type, there were others to fall back on. But gradually, industrialization and cheap fossil fuels made us less dependent on what grew well nearby. Food on the move from distant parts of the world comes the great variety of foods Americans demand. Most farmers switched from growing a variety of edible plants to a single crop that was easy to process and ship. As this model spread beyond the United States, older varieties of plants and animals disappeared from farms around the world. By 1970, 90% of the wheat varieties that had once been grown in China were gone, as were 80% of their varieties of maize or corn that were once grown in Mexico. By the summer of 1971, more than 85% of the corn planted in the U.S. was genetically identical. Crop scientists had bred this new corn so that it grew without a tassel, making it easier to harvest. But because these plants were genetic copies of one another, that also made them susceptible to the same deadly fungus, southern leaf corn blight. It took over the U.S. corn crop, costing farmers and taxpayers millions of dollars. And the damage would have continued if it weren't for a humble little plant called teosinte, the wild grass native to Oaxaca, Mexico, and the common ancestor of the 22,000 known varieties of corn. Teosinte includes a gene for resistance to the same fungus that was devastating the U.S. corn crop. Scientists halted the damage by crossbreeding teosinte with American corn, but that didn't totally solve the problem of genetic diversity. Today, more than 40% of the corn grown in the U.S. is derived from just six inbred lines. And seed companies, driven by profit, will often repackage genetic copies of the same seeds for different prices. Farmers plant them thinking that they're genetically diversifying their fields when really they're not. Since the corn crisis in 1971, disease has ravaged genetically uniform crops of beans, rice, tomatoes, and bananas. And it's about to get worse. The plants we eat have spent thousands of years evolving to grow in specific conditions, conditions we're changing rapidly by releasing more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We depend on corn, wheat, and rice for more than 60% of our global calories. And by 2050, we'll have 2 billion more people to feed. But because of climate change, we'll actually be producing less of all three of these crops we're going to need plants that can grow in radically different conditions. And the more genetic varieties we save, the better protected we'll be. There are seed banks all over the world where scientists, indigenous communities, and farmers are all preserving older seed varieties. But thousands have already been lost, which is why it's so critical to preserve the genetic diversity we still have. The weird stuff like red popcorn. And the best way to save the seeds that might save us one day is to grow them and eat them.
Welcome once again, everyone. Now for our pre-test, we will be using a game system to, in order to test your knowledge about the current module. Now, particularly we'll be using Kahoot to, to be able to log into the uh, Kahoot system. You need to open your browser and kindly type in www.kahoot.it. In there, you will be asked for a game pin and flash right in front of your screen is actually the game pin, which is 4063097. I see that some people are already logged in. Okay. During the game, you will be given a set of questions and there are multiple choices that you need to answer for around 20 seconds. Okay. So the fastest and the most accurate answer will give the highest points. So... Uh, kindly log in again 406 3097. So I see Anne, Michael, Annie, Maan, Steph, Carlos are, is already in the game. Okay. Take your time. Mm -hmm. So again, the fastest and most accurate. Okay. So don't get too much pressure. Some of these questions will probably be introduced throughout the module. Okay. Okay, I see I hook Jonas. Welcome. So I think we already have a total of twelve participants and counting. Thirteen. So again, if you uh, kindly open on a separate browser. So take note that the questions will be flashed on screen and in your browser, you will have a set of options that you need to choose from. So 20, question, uh, 20 seconds will be allotted for you to answer those questions. So we have a total of three questions. Okay, 15. Okay, I think everyone is already in the room. Let's start our Kahoot game, which is also a pretest. First question. A sustainable food system is triangle dependent on the efficient manufacturing of just a few species of food plant, diamond, one that promotes eating and grows well nearby, S circle, one that generates high cash incomes and employment, or square, all of the above. Okay, time's up. Seems that four out of the 13 participants that answered got it correctly. Let's see the letter board. Don't get discouraged if you didn't get it correctly correct this time. Steph is leading. Uh, next to her or him is Jonas and then Isaiah. Okay. Next question, please. Which statement is true about the conservation of indigenous vegetables? So, triangle, native vegetables are conserved only in field gene banks. Diamond, indigenous vegetables are conserved in gene banks and should not be accessible. 
circle. Planting in home garden is a way to conserve them or square none of the above. Time is up. It seems that we have a relatively uh, homogeneous, heterogeneous distribution of answers, but the correct answer is planting in home garden is a way to conserve them. Okay, so let's see who is leading. I see this, there's a change in face. We see Jonas leading uh, in this uh, set of questions, for, for, followed by Michael and then Steph. Okay, great. Let's proceed with the last question. What areas can be considered as part of in situ conservation? Is it triangle home gardens? Is it diamond natural reserves? It's a circle farms or square all of the above. Okay, that's great. It seems that a lot of our participants already know the correct answer. Nine out of the a total of 14 participants or 15 participants got it correctly. Okay, let's see the letter board. Our third placer is Steph. Congratulations. Followed by Carlos, second placer, and our winner is... First placer is Annie. Okay, great job, everyone. Regardless, don't get discouraged. We're still yet to uncover the Philippines one vegetable at a time. Give yourselves a round of applause. So now in this part, we will take see a glimpse of plant genetic resources, conservation and management for food and agriculture. Let's watch this presentation. to a loss in diversity of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, or PGRFA. These resources provide the basis for agricultural production and the world's food security, providing raw materials for farmers and plant breeders. Losing our food plants would certainly have catastrophic consequences. So what are plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, or PGRFA. These are materials of plant origin, including genetic parts and components that have actual or potential use to humanity. These materials can be in a form of, but are not limited to, seeds, pollen, whole plant, and explant. It is important now, more than ever, to be conscious of the conservation of PGRFA, to ensure that these food plants can adapt to changing environmental conditions in the field and in the wild, to preserve plant traits for crop improvement, to promote the utilization of these plants, and also to conserve plant genetic diversity for cultural reasons. Conservation can be done in C2 or XC2. In XC2 or offsite conservation, plants or plant materials for conservation can be collected from the field from identified sites. Materials can be acquired by exchange with and donations from gene banks, botanic gardens, breeders, and even farmers. Examples of national gene banks in the Philippines are the Rice Gene Bank of the Philippine Rice Research Institute and the Multicrop Gene Bank of the National Plant Genetic Resources Laboratory in the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Examples of international gene banks include the World Vegetable Center based in Taiwan and the International Rice Research Institute based in the Philippines. Deep inside the ice of Svalbard in Norway, there is a global seed vault to which countries have sent many of the world's important food plants for safety. Keeping. Perhaps the easiest to manage under the cold, dry conditions of the Arctic permafrost are orthodox seeds. Orthodox seeds are seeds that can be dried down to low moisture contents of around 5% to 
and stored under sub-freezing temperatures of about negative 20 degrees Celsius and still remain viable even for several hundred years. Common examples are seeds of rice, corn, wheat, and most leguminous crops. However, some plants have recalcitrant or intermediate seeds, or seeds that cannot survive extreme cold and if dried too much. Recalcitrant seeds are wet seeds that cannot be dried too much and must not be stored at sub-freezing temperatures, such as jackfruit, coconut, and mango seeds. Otherwise, these will not grow anymore. Intermediate seeds can withstand drying to some extent, such as coffee and papaya, but cannot tolerate cold storage like orthodox seeded species. Other plants like perennials and root crops are propagated through vegetative parts. Vegetatively propagated plants and plants that have seeds that are short-lived or sensitive to drying are best maintained in the field or in vitro. In field gene banks, live plants are maintained. This makes conserved materials easy to access for research and immediate use. In the field gene bank of the National Plant Genetic Resources Laboratory, in the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, more than 100 plant species are conserved, including some that are already over 100 years old. In vitro conservation, on the other hand, utilizes tissue culture techniques to keep plant cells, tissues, organs, or other plant parts alive in an uncontaminated and sanitized artificial environment. These plant parts, called excellence, are grown in liquid, semi-solid, or solid medium, such as broth or agar. Cryopreservation is a special kind of in vitro conservation in which explants are placed in very, very cold liquid nitrogen to stop their growth while conserving their viability and their genetic and physiological stability. This procedure uses a lot of resources and is thus used only in very special cases. Pollen conservation, for instance, is an emerging technology for genetic conservation that employs cryopreservation. When seeds are stored as genetic materials in gene banks, it's called seed conservation. When live plants are grown and maintained in field gene banks, it is called field conservation. When X plants, plant parts such as meristems and embryo, are maintained in a sterile, artificial environment, it is called in vitro conservation, and when pollen grains are used as material for storage, it is called pollen conservation. Now, what about in situ or on-site conservation? It is the maintenance or recovery of viable population of plant species in their natural surroundings, places where they have developed their distinctive properties. For example, peely nut or canarium ovatum and abaca or musa textilis collections are conserved in Bicol region and in Leyte province respectively. They are centers of diversity in the Philippines. The activities of communities and individual households also contribute to in situ conservation of plant genetic resources. Communities protect the natural habitats of food plants in the wild, while local farmers continue to grow traditional varieties of crops, such as this peria, a traditional rice of the Mandaya tribe in Mindanao. Different local varieties of sweet potato and yautia along filed borders and the many species of local food plants in backyards and home gardens continually maintained by households are all part of in situ conservation. Farmers often save seeds in sacks kept in special space at home. They hang fruits harvested for seed over the cook stove or the rafters to dry them out, as well as smoke out insect pests. Some communities have their own seed storage practices and structures, but seeds only remain viable until the next cropping season. Here, we help the community improve their traditional conservation practices while keeping the cultural elements such as traditional designs, materials, 
and representations of deities believed to watch over the seeds and crops. Indeed, there is something each one of us can do. We can grow our own food plants that grow well in our own communities for a more sustainable food supply on top of healthy diets. You can start your own backyard food chain bank in plots or in pots. What about your own seed bank? So I hope you learned something new about plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, okay? And since you already know some parts of it, its importance, the different conservation strategies, let's try to test it by having another game, okay? So in this game, you will be, uh, I'll be flashing a particular crop uh, through the following presentation. So uh, the game is called how will you conserve this crop species? So I hope it's already flashed, okay? So the game is how will you conserve this species? And you'll be given a crop species in this game and you will select appropriate conservation strategy, an appropriate conservation strategy or strategies. So it might be more than one and try to find out how to conserve the different crops. Okay, let's try with the first crop, okay? Kindly place your answer in the chat box, okay? So I'll see, okay? So let's start with the first crop species. How will you conserve rice or rice sativa? Is it through field gene bank, on-farm conservation, seed banks, or in vitro conservation? So take note that rice sativa is orthodox seeded. And all of the necessary biology or characteristics that you've learned about rice, kindly take them into account in answering. You can choose more than one answer, okay? Uh, go ahead, you may type it in your chat box so that we can see. I see D, C, C, A for some, okay? That's great, great. A, C, okay, great, good job, okay? Now, the correct answer is, let's take a look. It's actually on-farm conservation and seed bank. Take note in choosing the appropriate conservation strategy of a particular plant, you must know its biology, particularly its storage behavior. So rice is actually orthodox seeded. And so therefore, it, its seeds are amendable for storage in a very long time at dry and cold conditions. Aside from this, it's also annual, so it might be a bit difficult for you to maintain them in your field gene banks because of its seasonality and replanting every now and then. Okay, now let's proceed with the second crop species. How will you conserve cassava? Uh, in here, kindly disregard pollen storage. Okay, let's type in your answers. Cassava or manihot escolenta or manioc. Okay, let's see. Great job, guys. A and B, some of are saying D and B, some are saying A. Okay, that's good. At least you're trying to stimulate your minds right now into critically thinking what is the appropriate conservation strategy. Although these are major crop species, will be introduced with uh, indigenous ones later on, later on. Okay, great job. Now let's see the correct answer. It's actually field gene bank, on-farm conservation, and in vitro conservation. For the particular reason that during the domestication of cassava has led to its uh, flowering, uh, decreased precocity of flowering, meaning cassava, your domesticated cassava or cultivated cassava rarely flowers. Aside from that, it's also annual. So seed banking might be suboptimal and a suboptimal option for cassava con conservation. So other conservation techniques could be possible, such as you're in the field as field gene bank, or it, you might also do it in vitro, since there are protocols on in vitro or tissue cultural tissue culture of cassava. Okay, so let's proceed with the next question. How about mango, a very popular crop? Can it be conserved in the field, on farm, seed bank, or in vitro conservation? Go ahead. I'd like to know your opinion. 
Thank you very much for participating, by the way. So mango, the, some are saying it's B, A, A and B. Okay. It seems that they're getting the hang of this uh, game. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Great answers, everyone. Thank you very much for participating. Let's check. Mango. The correct answer is, okay, that is actually through field gene banks and on-farm conservation, particularly because mango is actually recalcitrant seeded. And when it's recalcitrant seeded, its seeds cannot be dried at low moisture content as well as stored at cold conditions, resulting to very frail seeds and short-lived seeds. Aside from that, you can't do in vitro culture in mango because more, most of the time it's a woody species and it's quite difficult to regenerate woody plants through tissue culture. Okay. Great. Now, we will also deal with the last crop, but take, let's take a look. Our last crop is sugar apple, coming from the family Anunnaceae or, and the scientific name Anonas comosa. How will you conserve this plant? I don't know if you know this plant, but I guess this is quite popular here in the Philippines. It's through the field gene bank, on-farm conservation, seed bank, and in vitro conservation. Okay, okay, that's great, great answers. Uh, let me check. Okay, some are saying B, C, C. Okay, great. Now let's check the answers for this part. It's actually field, on farm, and seed banks. Although uh, you might say that most fruit species are actually uh, recalcitrant seeded, it's not. You could see that. Your Anonas comosa is actually orthodox seeded despite being perennial. And so you can conserve your Anonas comosa through seed bank. Albeit it's quite impractical because for pragmatic reasons, what they usually do is to conserve them in the field because perennial plants have a long life cycle. And it's very long for them to be able to grow their fruits and trees and flowers and fruits. And so therefore, most of the time they're conserved in field gene bank. Bottom line is that you need to know your crop. Knowing your crop, its physiology, systematics, chemistry, all of the other characteristics, critical characteristics of your crop might help you identify the most appropriate conservation strategy. Aside from this, as you would have noticed, that on-farm conservation is always there. It's particularly because you can be part of it too. On-farm conservation is an in-situ conservation method. And therefore, anyone can take part of the conservation process. So in this regard, let's take a look at the different indigenous vegetables of the Philippines that need the concerted efforts in order to ensure food security and sustainability of food production. Now, let's take a look at the Philippines and rediscover one vegetable at a time through the following presentation. The Philippines is considered a wonder for its high diversity of plants. It is also rich in indigenous vegetables that are just waiting to be rediscovered. A team from the university went to 20 provinces across the country, a journey of rediscovery of Philippine indigenous vegetables. Underutilized and even slowly forgotten, these vegetables have nourished generations of Filipinos, a low-cost, readily available source of vitamins, micronutrients, antioxidants, and fiber. The team conducted focus group discussions. Community members made lists of indigenous vegetables in their villages the parts used in different dishes, their seasonality and other uses, as well as their marketability and accessibility. They also made resource maps that showed the lay of the land and the kinds of environments that these local food plants thrive in. They also found clues on the reasons for the slow disappearance of many indigenous vegetables. 145 indigenous vegetables were rediscovered. Here are a few of them. 
The popular leafy vegetables are very rich in vitamins A and C, as well as iron and calcium. Mostly gathered, they require from little or no maintenance, but provide highly nutritious food, practically free. Saluyot or jute is a high-fiber vegetable that becomes slimy when cooked. The most popular dish is jute leaves mixed with bamboo shoots and fish paste and may be cooked in coconut milk. Kalinum is a well-known low-maintenance ornamental, but it is also a good pot herb for fish soup dish. Alugbati or Malabar spinach is culturally associated with the Visaya group in Central and Southern Philippines. It has green and purple variants. You can blanch or cook it with other vegetables like the Visayan dish, lauoy. Flowers can also be vegetables. The hummingbird tree's flowers can be white, pink, and red, but white is most commonly eaten. Do not forget to remove the partly detached anther before cooking because it is bitter according to the women of the north. Himbabao tree can reach up to 10 feet high. The catkin is the cluster of tiny flowers that look like pale green worms hanging from tree branches when male and round when female. The male catkin is more popular and is a distinctive ingredient in the northern versions of the popular dishes pinakbet and dinengdeng. Kakawate is commonly used as hedge, trellis, or fence in the Philippines. The unopened flowers are popular vegetables in northern and central Philippines. Telosma population is diminishing because the flowers and immature fruits are gathered and consumed as vegetable before it can produce mature seeds. You can find it in forest margins in the northern Philippines. An initiative spearheaded by MMSU in collaboration with BUP Los Baños seeks to domesticate, propagate, and multiply this plant to save it from possible extinction. Labong is the fleshy core or pith of a bamboo shoot, which, along with jute leaves, is cooked with coconut cream and seasoned with fish paste. Fruits can also be vegetables, like rimas or breadfruit, and kamansi or bread nut, which are relatives of the highly popular jackfruit. Cook an immature jackfruit, breadfruit, or bread nut in coconut milk with optional dried fish. Karate is a very bitter fruit that is a relative of the eggplant, but tastes like bitter gourd. Boiled, broiled, fried, or mixed with other vegetables in a soup dish, the bitter eggplant is popular among some indigenous groups in the northern and southern Philippines. Legumes are high-protein vegetables. This means meat is not the only source of protein. This is very good to know because eating too much meat is bad for our body's health and for the health of the environment. Majority of traditional legumes are short-day plants, meaning they can only be grown at the time of the year when day length is shorter. In the Philippines, legumes are abundant from December to April. Legumes are mostly eaten as fresh pods, fresh seeds or dried seeds. Dry seeds make them available for our kitchens year-round. Young pads and even vine tips or leaf shoots are also sometimes eaten. Fund of garlic? Well, bawang gulay or garlic greens is the whole garlic plant before the bulb matures. At 45 day old, whole plants are sautéed and shriveled along squeezed tomatoes and seasoned with fish paste. Malunggay, the power vegetable. The leaves, flowers, and green pods are consumed as vegetables. The squash fruit is indeed a vegetable, and so are its flowers. Female flowers with or without small immature fruits are eaten, but others prefer them to grow into full-grown fruits. Rich in beta-carotene, squash is good for our eyes. And there's a hundred more that we rediscovered from the rich diversity of food plants and food culture.
each vegetable with its own distinct flavor, nutritional benefits, social cultural value, and livelihood contributions. We can all do something. Let's work to conserve our indigenous vegetables and share what we know. Indigenous vegetables are just there, waiting to be rediscovered and nurtured. Hey guys, let's eat our vegetables. Hello guys, good morning. After watching the video, I hope now you are more inspired to eat indigenous vegetables. So, let us proceed to a short sharing of indigenous vegetables in your country. We will do a short exercise for two to three minutes. Please type in the chat box the following. Name of your country, first. Second, name of one indigenous vegetables in your country that is slowly disappearing and consumption has decreased, or it is still present or existing, but not consumed or eaten anymore. Third, what can you do to promote consumption of the indigenous vegetables mentioned in item number two? We'll give you two to three minutes to do this exercise. Time starts now. Okay, we have a participant from Japan, Kiyo University, Maiko, Minami. You can just type keywords, okay? No need to expand. We will have a time in the question and answer portion for the discussion of your answers. Okay, no problem, Kiyo. Okay, we have from Ecuador and from Russia, from Russia with love. <laughs> right, use new growing method. And from Ecuador, we have Martino, use in the search. So we have from Southeast Asia, we have from Latin America, we have from Europe, South Korea, Magwort, making new recipes.
You still have one minute. How about the others? Okay, from Japan, Sato Kibi. Be taught how to utilize them by farmers. You already have four answers in the chat box. Okay, you can just continue writing your answers while I wrap up the, this session. So I require you to answer in the chat box, indigenous vegetables. So what really are indigenous vegetables? Indigenous vegetables include species either gathered from natural vegetation or encouraged to grow anywhere or it is cultivated. Its primary use is consumption in combination with start, starchy staple foods like rice, corn, banana, or even root crops like taro, sweet potato, and cassava, have been introduced deliberately or accidentally into the country and exist for a very long period of time. That's why we said they are indigenized in the Philippines. These are cheap sources of nutrients, especially proteins from legumes, fibers, vitamins, and minerals from leafy vegetables. With minimal to neck, no chemical inputs, it is healthier for us and for the environment. The key message of our group is that you and I can do something to promote the conservation and utilization of these indigenous vegetables to prevent them from disappearing. As indicated in the title of my session, you should know, grow, and eat indigenous vegetables. So let us join together to help preserve, conserve, and utilize these treasures, this wealth in our country. So your answers in the chat box will be discussed in the question and answer portion after the next session. And now we will proceed to the next session by a renowned plant genetic resource expert who works with local communities, the academe and policy makers at the national and international level to promote conservation and management. She will be giving practical tips for keeping seeds and plants at home. You'll learn more from, from her input. Please welcome Professor Teresita H. Borromeo. Hello. Hello. Now um, we know that conservation uh, is the best guarantee. You know, after knowing the importance of plant genetic resources, we know that conservation is the best guarantee to make the genetic resources available for the present and future generations. And now. I'm asking you who, who will conserve? We know that it's important to conserve, but who will conserve? Huh? It will not be only the staff of the gin band, but it's you and me. So all of us will be involved in conservation. So how do we conserve? Now I'll be giving you tips on conservation. Uh, simple ways by which you can, by yourself, conserve in your home or in your communities. So first thing is that you have to know the, how the plant is propagated. Prof. Rio a while ago said that you have to know your crop. So how is it propagated? Is it propagated by seed or by the vegetative plant parts. No? So if it is propagated by seed, we have to know whether it is, if it can tolerate drying or not. So we have to look at all these aspects before we go into the conservation of your specific crop. 
So suppose that it is uh, propagated by seed and it can tolerate drying. So the first thing that you have to do is to dry them after harvest, air dry them, and then you can further drying, use uh, the seeds using um, any desiccant available in the community. It could be lime, it could be charcoal, or it could be uh, those bits and pieces in your leather bags, those are called silica gels. You can collect them and put them in, in a, an airtight uh, bottles and put in your seeds. So the seeds, that silica gel will absorb this, the, the, the water in the seeds. So it will be dried. Okay. And then after drying, you can. Uh, the drying can take place around uh, a week or months, depending on uh, on the size of seeds as well as the physical characteristics of the seeds. Some seeds are shiny, um, and therefore uh, it's difficult to uh, withdraw the the water from the seeds. So it will take time. So once the seeds are dried, you have to uh, store them. You can actually pack them in uh, porous papers or you can uh, store them in airtight uh, containers so that um, because we know that seeds are very hygroscopic, especially in, in areas where the relative humidity is high, dry seeds will reabsorb water from the atmosphere. So it's always best if we can put the dry seeds in an airtight um, airtight bottles or airtight pockets like aluminum foils. Okay, so once it's there, it will, it will be uh, viable for more than six months or more than a year or two. Okay, so you can get seeds from there every time you, you plant in your garden. So the best thing actually in, in uh, genetic resources conservation is you have to grow them and utilize them so that they won't be lost. Uh, utilization is the best guarantee for conservation. So once it's there, you can uh, use them in any way you, you want, especially in your cooking. So if, it, if the seeds cannot be dried like mango or other uh, fruits, most of our tropical fruits are recalcitrant and therefore they, they cannot tolerate drying. So you simply dry them a bit for a day and then directly sow them in pots or in, in the soil. And then um, in, in for other uh, vegetative plant parts, uh, asexually propagated plant parts, you can select from healthy source planting materials. No? And then you can grow them similar to your recalcitrant seeds. But you need to consider the climatic requirements of the crop because some crops uh, require shade. For example, uh, ginger like shade, uh, shady uh, environment, and therefore you have to grow them in shade. And also, once they are in the field or in a field gene bank, you have to provide the water, nutrient, and pest management to have uh, better gro growth and development for, for all your crops, okay? Okay, so that is for seeds and vegetatively uh, propagated planting materials. Now, in a community, okay, you, uh, when you go to the community, you'll find out, no? this is what we found out, there is always one who will be a seed keeper. It means she, he or she keeps the seeds of the community. Okay? She has all this and conserve it in his little way. No? So by putting it in jars or drying and putting it in jars. And, the, and they also don't have only the seeds, but they also have the indigenous uh, knowledge about the genetic resources that he or she is maintaining. No? So from the seed keepers, uh, you and I can actually uh, get the planting material from her or him, and then you can use that 
in your home garden. Okay, in a community, you can actually establish a communal home garden where it will be managed by all of the members of the community. And the harvest and will be shared and will be available and accessible to all members of the community. When there is no available land for a communal garden, what can be done is that we can designate each member of the community to uh, grow a particular variety or a species that um, he will take care of and maintain. Okay, and that uh, that will be also monitored by the community. So he or she will be the source of that planting material should the community or should a member of the community needs it. Okay, so um, in, in doing conservation, you will actually not just plant, but you observe and you will, you will gain knowledge on how each one differentiates, how each one is better grown in a particular area. And with the continuous growing of these crops, you will notice that there could be variants. No? It's like your COVID-19, there are lots of variants. We have mutations that can occur. No? So those mutant plants can be additional sources of your genetic resources, and that can also be maintained, that can be selected, especially if, if it has an, uh, a, great, this, a great advantage, no? that mutation is a great advantage. Uh, we have used mutations for a long time, especially in, in your uh, in your ornamental plants and it will command high prices as well. Okay, so um, those are some tips and I hope we can, um, we can uh, share no, uh, all the experiences that you might have uh, when, you, uh, when you have experience doing your own home garden or uh, conservation through uh, keeping a particular seed in your household. So I think we can continue on your, your questions in our Q&A uh, portion, which will follow. So thank you, unless you have pertinent questions on this matter, then yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Borromeo, for that inspiring uh, message. So now, for the interest of time, we'll cut uh, our question and answer portion a bit short. So kindly type in the chat box the question and answer. And if you have any questions, you may also raise your hand. But also, from the, per from the people who have answered uh, the previous exercise on grow and eat indigenous vegetables, can, uh, one may also share their, uh, their experiences, particularly uh, those that have already been typed in the chat box. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. You have questions? So the team will be all here to answer your queries or yes. to... If you need further clarification, uh, you can shoot them now. Yes, so. we're very lucky to have with us in our team to answer our questions. Our curator and researcher, Ms. Delisa Dis Chavez, myself, Prof. Teresita Borromeo, Prof. Endonella, Dr. Lorna's sister, Prof. Ayan and, Kalayugan, and Mr. Cedric Bartolome. Go, go ahead, from Lorna. Hello, good morning. So while you are typing your questions, or if you have any in the chat box, I'd like to go back to the to the species that were posted earlier. So probably some of the team will ask you about, um, no, make comments about how to, to conserve them. They are not very familiar. We are not very familiar. So we are also taking that, we will be taking the first step of knowing your crop, for example. Yeah. So like rice or what kind of um, 
um, seed, if it is a seed that uh, is being used to yeah. propagate it. But I would like to, to point out the answer, uh, I mean, the comment from China, Yuan Sujun. So she, she said, or he said, sorry, I don't really know such vegetables. I think the realization that you don't know your indigenous vegetables, the local vegetables um, that grow naturally in your country is the first step. It's a real, an important realization for you to take forward. You are still young and there's still so many years ahead for you to be a champion for conserving your indigenous vegetables in your country. So you're already thinking of um, doing some lectures to help other people be aware of their existence and the importance to protect them. So thank you very much. Probably the other team members would like to look into the other, um, discuss the, but you will have to share what kind of. I think um, we have one raising his or her hand yes. uh, from thank Wasada you. University, Elena. Uh, you may unmute yourself and ask or share or suggest or comment on anything. Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for your good, great presentation. And uh, I have a question about the food conservation. As I wrote in the chat box, uh, uh, actually I'm from Russia, but now I live in Japan. And in Russia, uh, the most famous food is rye. But now uh, there is a problem that because of the climate, uh, global changes, climate changes, uh, uh, global warming, uh, or climate changes, the yields, uh, the yield of rye is falling, and uh, I don't know how to uh, make the situation better to uh, get more rye, uh, and uh, if if it, it is not uh, difficult for you to answer this question. Uh, I would like to ask how to improve this situation. Uh, thank you for listening. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, rai, rai is uh, cicala cereale, right? Um, yeah, and it has orthodox seeds. And fortunately, there are already accessions in the gene bank, especially at um, at. I uh, at Icarda, Icarda. and uh, so we can actually request if you want, if they are no longer there in Russia, you can request uh, the rye accessions from Russia from Icarda, which is the International Center for Agricultural okay. Research, uh, which is an international gin bank. No? So they are now based in Morocco and Lebanon because based before they are, were based in Syria, but because of the war, uh, they have reestablished their collections in Morocco and uh, Syria. So you can repatriate uh, any uh, accessions that were collected from, from uh, Russia. I'm sure, yeah, Babylon did one, uh, yes. a good collection yes. uh, because, you know, Babylon is from Russia and he is the father of uh, plant genetic resources. Yeah, so there's still hope. And uh, I, I know that there are still patches of rye populations in Russia right now and you can actually uh, collect them or uh, uh, nurture them, no? So uh, by uh, providing the farmers the importance of those remaining, remaining uh, rye accessions in the community. Uh, probably uh, Rio or Ayan may add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Montes. So I think uh, for the interest of time, uh, does anyone from those people that share their indigenous vegetable in their country would like to add or share uh, as a sharing uh, session? You may raise your hand. Okay. I, it seems that... Uh, I think Japan has... I, I, I think Korea, uh, University Korea from well. Kunwoo Park. Go ahead, kindly share. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, um, first of all, sorry that I, uh, my camera is not working. Oh, I'm I'm really sorry that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, 
Yeah, we can hear you. Oh Please yeah. Please proceed. Oh. I can't turn my camera right now, but I wanted to share about two different of uh, indigenous vegetables in Korea. One is called suk, and another one is called minari. Uh, among the younger population, uh, we consider those two vegetables as vegetables that are eaten by the older population. So younger population tend to um. Like not eat those vegetables, so uh, I think we we need to find ways to um to make those vegetables more um like like make y- the younger people eat like consume more of those vegetables. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. So- thank you very much. And indeed. Yes, conservation starts in your plate. If you have any additional questions, kindly type them in the chat box. We will surely answer them. But now for the interest of time, let's do our post tests. Okay, so these are, we still, we're still doing it using the Kahoot platform. So if you have, if you want to join, kindly type in the game pin 6609973. Okay, again, 6609973. Uh, again, if you want to have any questions, any additional comments or suggestions that you want to be clarified during the module, kindly type them and surely one of the people in the PGR team will be able to answer you. Okay. Isaiah is already in. Okay. So we have the same mechanics for this section. We have three post test questions and we will see whether or not uh, the overall score of the group ha- has already improved, okay? So let's check. So Carlos is already here, a total of six participants and counting, okay? Great. So again, the game pin is 6609973, okay? So it's still multiple choice question. And you need to pick one and one answer per question, and uh, for a total of three points. And the fastest and most accurate gets or garners the highest score. Okay, so we're still waiting for six more participants or seven. Mm-hmm. Steffi, okay, great. I hope everyone can join this time. So now I hope you're more accustomed. And we will, aside from that, we will also be discussing the answers to the tests uh, or uh, at least a short discussion in the, uh, during the post-test. Okay, 12. Okay, then let's start our post-test with question number one. Question number one, conservation of ecosystem and natural habitats of viable populations of species in their natural surroundings are called in C2 conservation triangle, diamond ex situ conservation, circle natural reserves or square, none of the above, okay? Conservation at natural ecosystems or habitats, okay? That's great. A lot more students are able or participants were able to get it correctly. It's in situ conservation or on-site conservation. And when what we mean by on-site, it's actually where they gain the, their distinctive characters. So it might not just be natural reserves, but actually include on-farm. Okay. So choose the best answer. Next question. Okay, let's see the letter board. Isaiah. I cook and then Mark is actually leading. Now let's try the next question. A sustainable food system is one that is dependent on a few species of food plants that are easy to manufacture for triangle, diamond one that provides work for many people, circle 
one that promotes a diet of local food plants grown in the community or square all of the above? Choose the best answer. Okay. A lot more is getting the correct answer. It's actually circle one that promotes a, a local diet of plants grown in the community. These include your indigenous vegetables. Okay. Now let's proceed with the last question. Now, Isaiah is still leading, followed by Paula, and then Cook, and then Mark, and then Michael. Okay, great job, everyone. Which statement is true about the conservation of indigenous vegetables? Triangle, native vegetables can be conserved only in gene banks. Diamond, native vegetables in, are conserved in home gardens, but, but must not be eaten. Circle, conservation means plants keep farmers or anyone from using them, or square, none of the above. Okay, the correct answer is none of the above. Of course, <laughs> the conservation of indigenous vegetable is quite inclusive. It means everyone can participate in the conservation process. So it might be in the field, gene banks or seed banks in ex situ conservation, or it might be in situ, in situ conservation in on-farm, in natural reserves, even in your own home garden, as long as it's where the crop gained its distinctive characteristics. Okay, let's see the letter board. Top three is Paula, congratulations. Yeah. Set, top two is Mark, and the winner, or top one is Isaiah. Okay, great job, guys. Uh, even if you're not in the letter board, we have runner-ups, M and Ma'an as well. Okay, great job, guys. So with that, in behalf of the PGR team, the Institute of Crop Science, uh, the people here right now in the PGR team, Prof. Tercita Borromeo, uh, researcher and curator, Ms. Elisa de Chavez, Dr. Lorna's sister, Dr. Leia Indonella, Prof. Ayan Kalayugan, and Mr. Cedric Bartolome. Thank you very much and have a great day ahead. Okay, Sir Rio, thank you very much. That was indeed a very interesting topic, very fruitful discussion. I appreciate our participants for having um, raised their concerns and questions regarding plant genetic resource conservation. So just being aware is the first step of conserving our indigenous species. So with that, let me present our certificate of appreci appreciation to our speakers for module one. Okay, kindly share, okay. The certificate of appreciation is awarded to Assistant Professor Rinerio P. Gentilian, Assistant Professor of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you, sir. And another certificate is awarded to Hedelisa de Chavez, researcher of the Plant Genetic Resource um, Laboratory of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you, Ma'am Heidi. And our certificate of appreciation is awarded to Prof. Teresita Borromeo, professor of the Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Po. And so thank you very much, PGR team. We have more in store for our participants. But before that, we'll give you a 10-minute health break to process all the information that is um, provided to you. So please stay connected and take your break. Do not disconnect and be back after 10 minutes. Thank you. 
Legend tells of a mysterious and beautiful goddess who dwells within the forest of Mount Makiling. Known as Maria Makiling, she supposedly guards the mountain and the forests. Myths depict her as a benevolent nature spirit, gifting communities with nature's bounty. While the reality of Maria Makiling's existence has never been proven, Mount Makiling itself its majestic beauty, and the rich bounty of resources and environmental services that it has provided is real. First established as a protected area in 1910, the Mount Makiling Forest Reserve has been under the care of UPLV since 1960. It covers an area of over 4,000 hectares and was declared an ASEAN Heritage Park in 2013. Mount Makiling boasts of an impressive diversity of flora and fauna, endemic, native, and introduced. Mount Makiling functions as both laboratory for forestry students and a tree nursery as UPLB leads efforts to study and preserve endangered tree species. It is a popular ecotourism destination that helps promote appreciation for nature and the need to preserve it. Popular sites in Mount Makiling include the Makiling Botanic Garden with its rich collection of tropical plants, the sulfuric mud springs, pig two, and flat rocks. Aside from taking up the role of steward, UPLB has kept Maria Makiling alive by making her a part of the community's culture and arts. Stories of the forest goddess are a popular theme for the many cultural activities that take place in UPLB such as theater productions, folk dance presentations, and art exhibits. The richness of culture and the arts in the university is expressed through many different art forms. These varying art forms serve as a reflection of the rich tapestry of culture and traditions of UPLE. Regardless of whether it is the mountain or the maiden, Mount Makiling has always been the stalwart and benevolent guardian and icon of UPLB. Throughout UPLB's long history, Mount Makiling has sheltered the community, served as a source of inspiration and wonder as UPLB continues its pursuit to preserve the environment, celebrate Filipino culture, and contribute to the country's growth and prosperity.
UPLB feels like home. The warm and friendly people. The professors are experts in the field. The enriching experiences that one gets to enjoy. Learning here is expensive and gives me great value for money. The diverse and the cosmopolitan nature of the graduate community makes me to learn much more in my classes. Apart from being a top university, UPLB also enables me to study so close to nature. The environment is intellectually stimulating and the scenery is refreshing and reinvigorating. One can easily strike a perfect work-life balance studying in UPLB. Don't put the reading for the day. You can spin around the campus on a bike or hike to the Botanic Gardens, to the Gateway to Mount McKinley, or take in and experience the beauty and excellence of the Filipino cultural performances and expression. UPLB is found at the foot of Mount McKinley Forest Reserve, an ASEAN Heritage Park. This is part of the reason why we have a clean and green campus. UPLB and Mount McKinley, which UPLB administers, showcase our commitment to biodiversity conservation. UPLB was the school of choice for me and my friends because we knew it is an excellent university for those who seek a career in science and engineering. UPLB values quality education. Hence, it's actively uh, pursuing quality assurance at both the program and institutional levels. A number of our pioneering and major undergraduate programs have already been certified by the ASEAN University Network Quality Assurance. We have institutionalized new UPLB graduate programs in niche areas that are designed for interdisciplinary collaboration, not only locally, but also satellite campuses institute where i'm currently undertaking my doctor of philosophy in international development degree locally we've been offering several off-campus graduate programs we have also established our presence in panabo city davao del norte in mindanao through the up professional school for agriculture and the environment I am here to study agriculture in UPLB because I believe I can learn so much in order to help my country. I think that when I finish my program and leave UPLB, I'll be better equipped to help solve the food security situation in my country. I am here because UPLB has a very good reputation and offers a course that I'm interested in. I'm taking a PhD in extension education which is also recognized in my country. What I especially like is that the professors are both academically very competent and supportive. The UPLB programs are relevant because these are based on the realities on the ground and are produced through a carefully thought process combining theory and practice. We champion a strong disciplinal and interdisciplinary lens in understanding and providing profound solutions to complex societal problems. UPLB is known for strong research culture that informs instruction and capacity building. The Philippines and the rest of the world is facing complex challenges in food security, biodiversity loss, climate change, uh, public health, and environmental degradation. We in UPLB are always in our toes so that we can prepare and uh, provide the necessary solutions to these challenges by way of our curricular uh, programs. So what are you waiting for? Look up UPLB's 28 undergraduate degree programs or its over 100 graduate degree programs at uplb.edu.ph. File that application for admission and experience what it's like to study in UPLB. Okay, I, it seems that everyone is back. We will now continue our discussion. And this time, we will touch your artistic side with a topic, the artistic technique of crop production to be presented by the Edible landscape, Landscaping Team led by our former Chancellor, 
Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez Jr. together with him um, are Assistant Professor Ryan Rodrigo Tayobong and Mr. Brian Lawas. Let's hear from the Edible Landscaping Team. Take it away, John. Hello, good morning, Ma'am Tonette. How are you? I hope you're having a good day. Good morning, everyone, to all our dear participants. I am John Lawas, University Research Associate of the Edible Landscaping Team from the Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So before we start our module this morning, module on edible landscaping, we have sent a link for a pre-test questionnaire which you will answer before we proceed with the module. So our tech team will send the link as well so you can easily access the pre-test. So uh, for the tech team, kindly send the link for the pre-test. So we will give you five minutes to accomplish the pre-test questionnaire. So it'll be easy. We only have 10 questions for you to answer. This will serve as a feedback for us if you have learned something during our discussion on edible landscaping. So after our discussion this morning, we will also have a post-test. So the tech team will also take care of that. All right. So we will give you five minutes. So please uh, answer the questionnaire online and I will get back to you in a short while. Thank you. I hope you have answered the pre-test questionnaire. I hope some of you are finished with answering. But before we start with our presentation or the lecture this morning, I will run you through the presentation. So for this morning, we will discuss edible landscaping. So we will discuss what is edible landscaping. I know you are interested to know more about edible landscaping. And of course, we will discuss how do we do edible landscaping. Of course, in your communities, in your countries, I know you are interested in planting your crops, growing your ornamental crops, especially when the COVID-19 hit our country, we're all stuck in our homes. That's why we are presenting to you Edible Landscaping. This is a technology where we will present you a different perspective on growing your own plants aesthetically. So I hope you have completed the pre-test questionnaire. Now I have with me in this set, 
Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez Jr., our project leader, and Assistant Professor Ryan Rodrigo Tayobong to discuss what is edible landscaping and how do we do edible landscaping. So, let's start. Sir Dindo, good morning. Umaga, Ohayo gusaymas, Anyong haseo, Dubraye utra, Selamat pagi. So good day everyone. I am Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez Jr., uh, Professor of uh, Landscape Horticulture from the Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. This morning, I will share with all of you a technology that can help you grow your own food while making your surroundings functional and attractive. And that is true edible landscaping. Edible landscaping is an approach that merges the science of crop production, especially organic agriculture practices, and the art of landscaping and garden designing and planning. In edible landscaping, we are using vegetables, fruits, herbs, and medicinal plants, and your usual ornamental plant. There is a 70-30 rule that we follow, at least 70% edible plants and 30% ornamental plants. But we want to achieve a 100% edible landscape garden. EL or edible landscaping has four goals, namely aesthetics, functionality, health and wellness, and self-sufficiency. When we say aesthetics, we want to create beautiful and attractive environments that will encourage people to engage in gardening. Aside from having a good view, we want our garden to have other functions depending on the needs of the end user. It can be a place of learning, relaxation, or meditation. We also want to create an awareness to the children at a young age to plant and eat vegetables through edible landscaping. And for our senior citizens, EL Garden can serve as an exercise and at the same time, therapy for them. EL also has the potential to address self-sufficiency at the household level. An EL Garden will ensure reliable source of safe, sufficient, and nutritious food even in times of crisis. Now let's move on to the components of edible landscaping. Edible landscaping has two major components, and these are your softscapes and hardscapes. Softscapes are your living components of the landscape or your plants and crops, especially your vegetables, fruits, herbs, medicinal plants, and your usual ornamental plants. On the other hand, hardscapes are the non-living components of the landscape. It can be motile or non-motile, which adds the functionality of the garden, like benches where we can sit, and as well as help us in the growth of our plants and crops, like our trellises. Now let's go through the example of each component. So softscape. Here are the main groups of softscapes that are commonly used in EL garden. We have our ground cover plants, which prevent soil erosion, like your yellow and red sweet potato or camote in the Philippines. Edging plants, which defines our walkways like the Mayanas on the screen. Barriers, screens, or hedges that provide security and may serve as windbreaks just like the katurai plant or your calamansi shrub. Foundation plants, which connect the ground to the structure 
in the vicinity of the garden like this variegated arrowroot plant. And lastly, accent and focal point, which catch the eyes of passerby and serves as the main visual component of the garden, like the bright pink flowering bougainvillea. So here are some considerations in choosing your subscapes. They should be edible and contain nutritional benefits. They should be based on your personal preference or diet. They should have an ornamental value. And lastly, they should be proportionate with the size of your garden. Now let's move on to hardscapes. So your hardscapes are the following. Your walkways, pebbles, pots, your lights, even install a waterfall, trellises or signages. These are examples of your hardscape. Here are some considerations in choosing your hardscape. Materials or the hardscape themselves should be readily available. It shall withstand the test of time, especially the forces of nature like rain, storms, and typhoons. Lastly, it should fit your budget for establishing your own edible landscape garden. So now, everyone, let's have a review. I have two questions for you to answer. Just type it in in your chat box, and I'll give you 20 seconds to answer them. The first question, what are the four goals of edible landscaping? Time starts now. Okay, time's up. The answers are aesthetics, functionality, health and wellness, and self-sufficiency. Okay, let's now proceed to the second question. What are the two components of edible landscaping? Time starts now. Okay, time's up. So the answers are your softscapes and your hardscapes. So great job, everyone. Now that we have learned what edible landscaping is, we now move on how do we do edible landscaping. In edible landscaping, we have the edible landscaping triangle, which signifies the process and face involved in the technology. First is the design phase, followed by the implementation phase, and last, the maintenance phase. Now I'll discuss the first phase, which is the design phase. For the design phase, I'll share with all of you the elements and principles of design which is essential in achieving attractive and functional EL gardens. First, let's go through the elements of design. So there are four elements of design that I will discuss, namely form, color, line, and texture. First, form. It can be upright, like the onion chives, spreading like the lettuce, 
or rounded like the cabbages or cauliflowers. Also, these forms can also apply with the hardscapes of the structures we will construct or install in the garden. For color, we can have a variety of choices. We can even have the colors of the rainbow in our garden. Here are some examples you can use uh, in our garden. You can use variegated plants with streaks of yellow and green, like this variegated citrus or calamansi. Light colored plants like this gabi or taro. And a pop of color like this lettuce with a maroonish color and variation of orange or red used at the tip of the leaves. In addition, you can paint your hardscapes a color that will elevate the appearance of the garden, or you can choose materials with aesthetically pleasing colors. With line, it can be straight or curved. For path walks, you can follow the contour of the landscape to achieve a natural effect. Or, your, or you may design it the way you like it, whether straight, curb, or a combination of both in one garden. Lastly, texture, which can be smooth like the appearance of this lemongrass or rough like those leaf of lettuce. So now let's proceed through the principles of design. I will discuss five principles of design which can help you plan your EL garden. And these are balance, contrast, scale and proportion, emphasis, and the most important, harmony. There are two types of balance which, can, which we can use. First is formal or asymmetrical balance. This can be achieved through dividing your garden at the middle, similar with this photograph. Technically, both sides should have the same features and weight in appearance. Technically, what you see at the left is what you see at the right side. This is a common appearance or design of English gardens. It tends to be boring and monotonous if used extensively. But with this type of balance creates formality in the garden design. This is usually used in formal entryways of your home and institutions. The next type of formal, formal balance is your radial balance. You can associate this with a circle or a wheel, which is equidistant and the design is similar in section. The second one is your informal or asymmetrical balance. What you see at the left is not what you can see at the right. They are totally different. This type of balance is, balance is associated with the equal weight of the elements of the garden, like the one in the photo in your screen. It is much harder and challenging to achieve but it gives much more interest than your formal balance. Another principle is contrast. This is the degree of difference in the treatment of different elements. This can be achieved through texture and or the color of the plants and hardscapes in your garden. Scale is the size of one object in relation to the other objects in the design or artwork. Proportion, on the other hand, refers to the size of the parts of an object in relationship to other parts of the same object. Usually, odd or unconventional use of scale and proportion is not prioritized in edible landscaping, like oversized trellis, oversized benches, but as the saying goes, your imagination 
is the limit. Emphasis is having a central or focal point in your garden. Take note, there should only be one focal point so that our viewers will not get confused. Lastly, the most and the most important principle, which is harmony. A pleasing relationship between all the different parts of the design, making each object or component a part of the whole. Without harmony, there will be chaos. So here are some tips in designing and planning, which we always share with our participants. First, be careful in using too many colors, textures, and forms. This will create what we call here in the Philippines, chapsui effect. As the contrast becomes higher, it tends to give a chaotic effect. However, no contrast tends to be boring. All right, dear participants, to end my discussion, here's another review. Enumerate the design elements and principles used in the edible landscape garden of the Department of Agriculture, Quezon Agricultural Research and Experiment Station. You can put your answers in the chat box. And time starts now. Okay. Okay. Time's up. It seems that the answer are in in this garden. All of the design elements were used: form, color, line, and texture. While the prominent design principles used are balance, contrast, and harmony. So that's it for the design phase. Now I'll give you to Assistant Professor Ryan Rodrigo Tayobong for the discussion of the implementation and maintenance phase of the edible landscaping triangle. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez, for sharing what is edible landscaping and the first phase of edible landscape triangle. Good day, everyone. I am Assistant Professor Ryan Rodrigo P. Tayobong, and I will discuss the two remaining phases of edible landscape triangle, the implementation and maintenance phase. So let's review first before going through the next phases. The edible landscape triangle is composed of three phases, and these are design, implementation, and maintenance. Now, let's go through the implementation phase. After reviewing your design, the first step in the implementation phase is to clear your site of any existing structure or plants that is not part of your design or plan. Always remember, during site clearing, you have to pinpoint the plants that you have to cut and transfer to other areas. After site clearing, next is laying out. This will help you visualize the coverage of the plants in the landscape and the location of the hardscape which will be constructed or installed on site. This will also help in reducing the confusion of where to plant your materials soon after laying out. Hardscape construction. After clearing your site and laying out your design or plan, next is constructing or installing your hardscape. Always remember, 
Install first your hardscape before your softscapes. Now, let's go planting. First, you should prepare your materials like seeds, potting mix or growing media, pots, water sprinkler, and other materials to be used for sowing. For the seeds, you can use hybrids or open pollinated varieties. Next, prepare your soil media or growing media. You can do this by mixing one part of garden soil, compost, and cordas or rice hull, or any material available in your garden. For the soil solarization, you can do this by exposing your growing media under the sun or using steam to kill soil-borne pathogens and weeds. Now, preparing the seedling tray, we'll now go to planting. After sterilizing your soil, you should cool it down. Then, fill the seedling, so seedling tray with soil. You may use recycled materials as containers for your seeds or seedlings. For sowing of seed, it is important to take note that you have two options for planting your seeds. One is direct seeding and one is for transplanting. Root type vegetable should be directly seeded in the field while other types of vegetable can be transplanted. Now that you have sown the seeds, wait for your seedlings to germinate and produce two to three types of true leaves. When two to three leaves plant appear, you may proceed to hardening the seedlings, which will prepare the plant for transplanting. This will help the plant overcome transplanting shock. So how can we perform hardening off? We can do this by gradual watering of our plants or gradual exposure to direct sunlight. Before I end up the implementation phase, let's look upon the remaining steps for planting. You have to prepare the soil, apply fertilizer through basal method, start transplanting, and then water your seedlings after sowing. Before I end the implementation phase, here's a video on seedling preparation, which you can easily do in your homes and communities.
That's great. I hope we learn a lot from the video on how to prepare your seedling. Now, time for a review. Put your answers in the chat box. Arrange the steps of the implementation phase. A, planting. B, hardscape construction. C, site clearing. And D, laying out. I will give you 15 seconds to drop your answer in our chat box. Timer starts now. Okay, great. Okay, so the answer for this review is C, B, A, and D. Take note. First, you have to clear your site, lay out the plan, construct or install your hardscape, and lastly, plant your softscapes. Now that we finished the design and implementation phase, let's move on to the maintenance phase. Maintenance phase of the edible landscape triangle involves all practices in the landscape maintenance and some of the applicable special practices in crop production, which are applicable to your garden. For the maintenance phase, I will share more than six maintenance practices that are done or practiced in edible landscaping. These are watering, pruning or trimming, pest management, nutrient management, other special practices, and lastly, harvesting. So let's start. First is watering. You should water your plants early in the morning, late in the afternoon, or when needed. Always consider the requirements of your plants and the soil moisture level. Next is pruning or the judicial cutting of plant parts. Pruning or trimming your plants will help you maintain the shape or appearance of the plants, especially when there are infected or infested plant parts. This will help in regaining the beauty or aesthetic of your garden and at the same time, avoid the spread of diseases. Next is pest management. We can use biocon agents such as parasitoid, and predators of insect pests that will control and inhibit the growth of such insect pests in our EL garden. For the pest management, always monitor the health of your plant and the population of your insect and the spread of your diseases. It is very important to have basic knowledge in dealing with the damages and infections produced by your diseases. Next is nutrient management. For nutrient management, we use organic concoctions to maintain the health of our plants to ensure resistance to pests and diseases and ensure healthy and bountiful harvest. Some of our botanical concoctions used in our edible landscape gardens are FPJ or fermented plant juice, FFJ or fermented fruit juice, and OHN or Oriental Herb Nutrient. Here's a video where we will see how these concoctions are made.
Okay, that's a great video and easy to follow step one. I hope you enjoyed the video. But just a quick note, OHN can also be used as a pesticide. Just dilute two tablespoons of OHN in one liter of water. Moving on, in edible landscaping, we also encourage creating your own cropping or planting calendar. Cropping or planting calendar will help you in preparing your vegetables or edibles before and after one cropping cycle. It will also help you in identifying the components of your layout, as well as plan for companion planting. This will ensure healthy growth of our plants considering their symbiotic relationship, either friends or foe. An example is shown in the screen. For example, eggplant can be planted with beans and pepper, but avoid mixing it with fennel. Next, in edible landscaping, we encourage you to set up your own vermicomposting bin and a nursery. This will ensure source of fertilizer for the plants in form of vermicast, and a nursery will help us grow our seedlings while waiting for the mature plants to bear fruits that are ready to be harvested. With that being said, let's move on to harvesting. Lastly, in edible landscaping, we promote staggered harvesting, especially to annual leafy vegetables. This is to maintain the shape and appearance of the garden during harvest time. For leafy vegetable, rather than harvesting the whole plant, you can just pick selected leaves for your meal preparation. Now, let's have a review. I'll give you 20 seconds to enumerate at least three maintenance practices of EL that I discussed earlier. Put your answer in our chat box. Timer starts now. All right, I hope you can enumerate all, but for now, let's see what are the practices for the maintenance phase. Watering, pruning or trimming, pest management, nutrient management, special practices, and harvesting. All right, so let's go back to the three phases of edible landscaping. These are the design phase, the implementation phase, and the maintenance phase. These three phases completes the edible landscape triangle. Always remember these phases in order for you to keep up in implementing your edible landscape triangle. So here are contact information. Please shoot us a message if you want to connect with our team. Lastly, we would also like to thank the following institutions and people that made our projects possible. I hope you learn a lot in this session. Thank you very much. And again, I am Ryan Rodrigo P. Teobong from the Institute of Crop Science. Thank you. Okay, let's wait for John. Okay.
meron akong kanang para sa'yo Handa ka na ba sa konsepto? Bubusugin ang kalamay Gamit ang pagkakalaman Mas ligtas na pagkain Dahil tayo ang magtatanim Dapat gawin Para Sa labas ng ating bahay Lika Magtanim tayo ng kulay Tara Lupay bigyan ng kulay Tunging ka akit-akit At natin bigyan ng buhay Tayo'y magtanim Ito'y ating palagihin Lupay pagandahin Ani ay paramihin Palapasin Ito ay para sa atin Edible landscaping Tara na queen Anong gulay o prutas ang iyong gusto Kangkong patola, sibuyas, pandan, pinya, bayabas Patamatan na pwedeng kahit sino Businessman bambabatas O tiyupe sa payatas Mas ligtas na pagkain Dahil tayo ang magtatanim Edible landscaping Ito ang ating dapat gawin Tara Sa labas ng ating bahay Lika Tanim tayo ng gulay Tara Lupa'y bigyan ng kulay Gawin ka akit-akit Tatating bigyan ng buhay Tayo'y magtanim Ito'y ating palakihin Lupa'y pagandahin Ani ay paramihin Huwag ka lapasin Ito'y para sa atin Pwede pa landscaping Tara sa labas ng ating bahay, lika Magtanim tayo ng gulay, tara Lupa'y bigyan ng kulay Gawing kaakit-akit at ating bigyan ng buhay Tayo'y magtanim Ito'y ating palagihin Lupa'y pagandahin Ani ay paramihin Huwag palapasin Ito'y para sa atin Okay, I hope you have enjoyed the lectures that we have presented. So this morning, we discussed what is edible landscaping. Dr. Sanchez discussed the four goals of edible landscaping, and these are aesthetics, functionality, health and wellness, and self-sufficiency. And we also learned about the two components of edible landscaping, which are the softscapes and the hardscapes. So the softscapes are the living components of your landscape while the hardscapes are the non-living these are the structures or these are the pots that you can use in your edible landscape then we run through to how do we do edible landscaping i hope you have appreciated our present presentation with the photos that we have presented so those photos that we presented are part of the el gardens that we have established throughout the year so we discussed the phases of edible landscaping we have the design phase where we plan and design our EL garden. We discuss the four elements of design and the five principles that will help us visualize our garden. Especially, it is easier for us to design in paper 
and correct our errors in paper than when it is already established. Of course, it's a cost-effective measure for us, especially when we are on a tight budget. The next phase, the second phase, is the implementation phase. So we will implement what we planned and designed. So after we planned and designed our edible landscape in our homes or communities or even workplaces, we will proceed to implementation where we clear our sites, where, where we do site clearing, then we construct our hardscapes, then moving forward to planting our plants or the softscapes. So we have shown you the video on how can you sow, how can you grow your seeds into seedlings where you can plant in your edible garden. Then moving forward to the maintenance phase where we showed uh, different maintenance practices that you can do in your gardens. These are uh, simple and easily to do. Uh, you can easily practice these in your community since these are the cultural practices that are being done when you are growing your own crops. So you can refer to different materials online and YouTube, Facebook, etc. You can search in Google so you can easily review these cultural practices. And if you have questions, you can shoot us a message through the contact information that we have provided earlier. Now, let us proceed with the EL Garden Design idea. So throughout the year since 2010, we have constructed, implemented, and designed different edible landscape gardens around the Philippines. And we have participated in a garden and tea show in Korea last 2015 and 2016. So let me share my screen so I can uh, show you the photos of EL Garden ideas that we you can easily implement in your communities or in your country. So I hope you can see my screen already. All right. Now, so for the EL Garden design ideas, so as what I have mentioned earlier, these designs are implemented or are designed and planned by our team. So let's go through these designs. First, let us discuss the types of garden according to scale. So I will show you photos of residential edible landscape gardens, educational edi edible landscape gardens, institutional and public edible landscape gardens. First, let's go to residential gardens. As you can see, the principles and elements of design were implemented or used in the gardens in your screen. So you can see the pop of colors, the form, the curved line where we use and we followed the contour of the site or the landscape. So to make it uh, more adaptable to the space that is available in our homes. As you can see, we utilize the spaces available in order to, for us to plant edible plants and of course, ornamental plants. But what you are seeing on your screen is a 100% edible landscape garden. Now moving on, an educational landscape garden where your kids, or especially right now, during the pandemic, the schools were shut down. And, and before the pandemic, we use edible landscape gardens as learning sites where students can learn about planting their crops or they can use it to learn science, arts, and other subjects that are applicable in their curriculum. As you can see in your screen, that is a site in Mahai High Elementary school, school here in the Philippines where the students use their uh, harvest, their crops that they have harvested in their school feeding program. So I hope you can draw inspiration from the, these types of garden in your hometowns. As you can see on your screen, that is in Labuin Elementary School here in Pila, Laguna, Philippines, where we use different edible plants that the students can learn from, especially studying the anatomy of the plant or they can harvest it and include it in their home gardening. And of course, when they cook it in their classes. Moving on, institutional gardens here. As you can see, we also use different edible plants. And of course, we use the design elements and principles. Institutional garden, our demo garden in Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Agricultural Research in Quezon City. As you can see, we use an informal balance there as what is uh, cited earlier. 
So usually informal balance is used in Japanese type of gardens. It's it is challenging to achieve, but with the aesthetic quality that it gives, it is really rewarding for you to have an informal balance in your garden. Moving forward, a public garden in Children's Park. We did this before the pandemic, but we haven't been there. But as you can see, in public spaces, we can also have edible landscape gardens. Of course, to entice our viewers, one of the goals of edible landscaping is aesthetics. Of course, we want to encourage other people to be attracted. Of course, we want them to have their own edible gardens in their own homes. Next set of the types of gardens, we have our team gardens. As you can see, we have we, you can have a salad garden, an herb garden, a vertical garden, or a square foot garden. So let's go through these examples. So you can have a garden where you can easily pick your ingredients for your salad. You can have lettuce, you can have kale, you can have tomato, you can have different ingredients for your uh, favorite or typical salad. Of course, we can also have an herb garden where you can pick herbs that you can include your, in your daily dishes. So we can have basil, tarragon, we can have thyme, rosemary, oregano, etc. So your imagination is your limit, but take note of the physical and chemical properties of each plant so that it, they will grow, uh, fully grow, and it will not affect the growth and development of each plant when planted with each other. Next, as you can see, that is an exhibition of a vertical garden. So as you can see, we use uh, stands where we put uh, pots and containers that were placed vertically. So in edible landscape, we can infuse vertical gardening in our design. Next, a square foot garden. As you can see, uh, it's not only a square foot, but the principle of square foot gardening is that in a square foot, we can have different types of crops and we can introduce bio-intensive gardening, or what we call big here in the Philippines. And the last set of the garden designs that we can draw inspiration from are urban gardens that we have designed and developed before the pandemic in line with our project. So we have our balcony gardens, pocket gardens, container gardens, and community gardens. So these designs are available or applicable for urban spaces, especially in urban spaces, especially here in the Philippines. Urban spaces, when we say, when you live in urban communities, you have a limited space, so you cannot really grow your own food. But we will make this possible through the designs that I will present to you. First, a balcony garden. So this design includes 11 types of plants. So you can have your sili or your chilies, your okra, tomato, eggplant, lettuces, pet chai, mustard, cucumber, herbs, and you can have your calamansi shrubs or citrus shrubs in your two uh, in your four by 1.5 meter edible landscape garden. You can use pots, containers, and vertical garden tools such as containers. Next, a park pocket garden can elevate your house's facade. So you have different types of plants, edible plants that you can use. You can mix this with your ornamental plants, but take note of the rule that Dr. Sanchez told earlier. We have the 70-30 rule. At least 70% edible plants and at most 30% edible plants. But we want 100% edible plant landscape garden. So as you can see, we can have an edible landscape garden with only a four by two meter square area. All right. The third one is a container garden where, which we can install in our rooftops. Sorry. As you can see in a container garden, we have 25 types of crops or plants. We can have tomatoes, spring onions, targons, carrots, mustard, kangkong, or your water spinach. We can have different types of annual plants or our vegetables, our perennial fruits like our citrus, our papaya, or we can also include our mint, basil, rosemary, our herbs and spices here in our container garden, which can be installed in rooftops in our workplaces or in our condominiums. Lastly, a community garden. So in a 10 by 10 meter squared area, we can have a community garden where we can have 24 types of plants. And as you can see, we have 
use sparingly the design elements and principles. As you can see, we use a pop of red there. We use a yellow type colored of trellis. We arrange our plants in a manner that is balanced, which is formally balanced. And of course, there is harmony, which is the most important principle in designing. So when there is harmony, of course, there is chaos, as, as what Dr. Sanchez have told earlier. Okay, so I have reviewed you through the edible landscaping garden, and I hope you have appreciated what we have taught you or we have what we have shared with you this morning. And I hope we have inspired you to grow your own plants in your own homes and, of course, do it in an aesthetic manner. All right, so before we end our module two on edible landscaping, let's have an activity. You can scan the QR code on your screens or you can go to your menti.com and enter the code flashed on your screen. So you can just uh, scan the code on your screens or you can go to your browsers if you're using Google Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Microsoft Edge, or whatever browser is available in your countries. You can go to menti.com and enter the code in your screen. So the tech will also share the code and of course the site where we can go. Okay. All right, I'll flash the screen for a few seconds so I can share my screen during a for the Menti presentation, okay? Then again, go to menti.com in your browsers and enter the code 1512-8367. Six, seven, or you can scan the QR code flashed on your screens. Again, go to menti.com and enter the code 1512-8367 or scan the QR code. All right, I, I hope you are inside. So keep those hearts and heart and likes coming. So I can see in my screen that you are in. So we have seven participants in the room. So let me share my screen to you so you can see what I am seeing in my laptop right now. All right. So we have this Menti meter. So keep those hearts and likes coming. All right, guys. We're already 13, 14 in the room. Okay. Please like, please hit the heart button. Sorry. Please hit the heart button. So we're already 14 in the room. So I'll just wait for us to go to, let's say, 20 before we start this short activity. Okay. Okay, click the heart or like button. So what are you feeling? Are you feeling happy or just feeling meh or whatever you're feeling right now? So we're only 14 here in the Zoom meeting room. So let's wait for others to come before we proceed with our activity this morning. All right, so let's start. All right, so please enter your name so you can see in your screens that you have your icon. So who's the wolf? Who's the fish? The snowman? A unicorn. Wow. <laughs> a dragon and a volcano. So please enter your names in your menti meter. All right. So let's go to the first question. Answer fast to get more points. So this is not graded. So the first question, this refers to the sensation of bigness or smallness within a space. So is it harmony, scale and proportion, or contrast? We have seven seconds on the clock. All right? Three, two, one, and time's up. All right, are the responses in? Okay. Seems like the responses are in. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Nine got it right. So the answer is scale and proportion. So it refers to the sensation of bigness or smallness relative to the space or the area that we will install in our edible landscape garden. So three got it wrong. Unfortunately, habol na lang tayo. All right, next question. This refers to the degree of difference in the treatment of different elements in the landscape. So what is it? Is it balance, emphasis, or contrast? Okay? 13 seconds on the clock. Two, one. Okay, time's up. Now, the answer is contrast. Oh, Interesting. So four got it wrong. They answered balance. But the answer for this particular identification question is contrast. So this refers to the degree of difference in the treatment of different elements. We can achieve contrast in texture or color. Our next question. All right. Without blank, there is chaos. I, I hope you can answer this easily. So without blank, there is chaos. Is it balance, harmony, or emphasis? What is it? You have 10 seconds left on the clock. All right. Time's up. All right. What's the answer? Oh my gosh. <laughs> One participant got it wrong, but the correct answer is harmony. Dr. Sanchez told us that without harmony, there is chaos. We're down to our last two questions for this activity. What are the dominant design principles used in this garden? So in your screens, you have three tabs where you can input one design principle. So I want you to input the top three dominant design principles that is being used in the EL garden that you can see in your screen, in your screen. So that garden is the UPLB technology demonstration garden of the edible landscaping team. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds to input your answer. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 3, 2, 1. All right, so what are your responses? So as you can see, we have used this we have used harmony, of course, the combination of the design elements and principles. Of course, we use balance, emphasis, contrast. Okay. Lots of plants available. Symmetry, of course. Radial balance, you're right. Emphasis, of course. The main focal point of the garden is the bright pink-colored Vogambilia. Contrast, of course, we, we can see contrast in texture and we can see contrast in colors. All right. So then again, the principles of design that were discussed earlier are the following that you can see in your screen, the, the bigger uh, words flash on your screen. So there's balance, emphasis, color, and contrast. And of course, there's harmony. So when we talk about principle, this is the uh, conjunction of the elements discussed earlier. Next, what are the dominant design principles used in this garden? This is the Techno Demo Garden in the Diwali Cathedral Christian Church in Surigao del Norte, Philippines. So, so this is the garden design planned and developed by our team for their community. So. What are the dominant design principles? Take note, design principles used in the garden. So you have 10 seconds left in your clocks. All right? Okay, so what are the design principles used? Design principles, take note of that, dear participants. Okay. I can see that there's color. Color is an element of design. There is harmony. You're right. There's balance, although an informal balance is used in this garden design. That's great. There, there are people answering asymmetrical balance. 
there is color, harmony, etc. and emphasis. That's great. Uh, what I am seeing right now, it manifests that you have learned something from our presentation earlier. Okay. All right. That's it for our presentation, for our activity. So before I end my presentation, I would like to flash again our contact information. So if you're interested to partner with our team, the Edible Landscaping team of UPLB, you can tag us. You can find us in our social media platforms in Facebook and Instagram. You can also email us in our email address. So in Facebook, you can find us in Facebook through facebook.com slash ELUPLB. And of course, in email, uh, the tech team will flash the contact information of the Edible Landscaping team if you wish to partner with us. All right, let me share my screen first. Okay. So here are the contact information of the team. As you can see, you can find us on Facebook, Edible Landscaping UPLB, so you can be updated with our happenings. Of course, you can get posted with activities of the Edible Landscaping team of UPLB. You can also follow us on Instagram, edible underscore landscaping underscore UPLB. And of course, you can shoot us an email if you want to partner with us. If you want to invite us in your country or in your community to share edible landscaping with your stakeholders and partners, shoot us an email through edibelandscaping.uplb at ub.edu.ph. All right. That's it for the module two on edible landscaping. I hope you have learned a lot and enjoyed our presentation this morning. Back to you, Ma'am Tonette. Okay. Thank you very much, Jan. Truly, it's very engaging and very inter interactive one. Thank you, Edible Landscaping team, for sharing with us some useful tips and practical um, applications on how we can make use of our own spaces with uh, aesthetically and functionally to provide nutritious and quality food. And now, may I present our Certificate of Appreciation for our speakers for Module 2. Our Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Mr. John Brian E. Lawas, University Research Associate of the Institute of Crop Science, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Panos. Thank you very much, John. Also, a similar certificate is awarded to Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez, Jr., Professor of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, Sir Dindo. And then lastly, our, our Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Assistant Professor Ryan Rodrigo P. Tayobong, Assistant Professor of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, so before we end our this morning's event, uh, Dr. Anna, uh, Director Anna Fermalino will join us to close the morning session and give us some reminders before our lunch. So, Ma'am Anna, the floor is yours. Hello, all APRU participants. We know you've had a very busy morning today. So, uh, we know that you need to take a break, but please do not disconnect from the Zoom meeting. We'll be back here in um, UPLB at 1 p.m. Don't miss out on the tour of UPLB that will be presented to you when we reconvene this afternoon. Uh, before we leave for this morning, we'd like to thank all of our experts from the College of Agriculture and Food Science here in UPLB. We'd also like to acknowledge the technical support of our Office of the Public Relations, also of our Information Technology Center, and for our beautiful stage set, our University Planning and Maintenance Office personnel. So please be back by 1 p.m. this afternoon for more talks on food 
and nutrition. See you at one. Go, go. Legend tells of a mysterious and beautiful goddess who dwells within the forest of Mount Makiling. Known as Maria Makiling, she supposedly guards the mountain and the forests. Myths depict her as a benevolent nature spirit, gifting communities with nature's bounty. While the reality of Maria Makiling's existence has never been proven, Mount Makiling itself its majestic beauty, and the rich bounty of resources and environmental services that it has provided is real. First established as a protected area in 1910, the Mount Makiling Forest Reserve has been under the care of UPLV since 1960. It covers an area of over 4,000 hectares and was declared an ASEAN Heritage Park in 2013. Mount Makiling boasts of an impressive diversity of flora and fauna, endemic, native, and introduced. Mount Makiling functions as both laboratory for forestry students and a tree nursery as UPLB leads efforts to study and preserve endangered tree species. It is a popular ecotourism destination that helps promote appreciation for nature and the need to preserve it. Popular sites in Mount Makiling include the Makiling Botanic Garden with its rich collection of tropical plants, the sulfuric mud springs, fig tube, and flat rocks. Aside from taking up the role of steward, UPLB has kept Maria Makiling alive by making her a part of the community's culture and arts. Stories of the forest goddess are a popular theme for the many cultural activities that take place in UPLB, such as theater productions, folk dance presentations, and art exhibits. The richness of culture and the arts in the university is expressed through many different art forms. These varying art forms serve as a reflection of the rich tapestry of culture and traditions of UPLB. Regardless of whether it is the mountain or the maiden, Mount Makiling has always been the stalwart and benevolent guardian and icon of UPLB. Throughout UPLB's long history, Mount Makiling has sheltered the community, served as a source of inspiration and wonder as UPLB continues its pursuit to preserve the environment, celebrate Filipino culture, and contribute to the country's growth and prosperity. UPLB feels like home. The warm and friendly people. The professors are experts in the field. The enriching experiences that one gets to enjoy. Learning here is expensive and gives me great value.
you for money. The diverse and the cosmopolitan nature of the graduate community makes me to learn much more in my classes. Apart from being a, a center of excellence, UPLB a nurturing space for innovation, so creativity, the and academic is intellectually stimulating. This and is the, the university. As a constituent university of the university, easily strike a perfect work-life balance studying in UPLB. Don't put the reading for the day. Take a spin around the campus on a bike or hike to the Botanic Gardens, to the Gateway to Mount McKinley, or take in and experience the beauty and excellence of the Filipino cultural performances and expression. UPLB is found at the foot of Mount McKinley Forest Reserve, an ASEAN Heritage Park. This is part of the reason why we have a clean and green campus. UPLB and Mount McKinley, which UPLB administers, showcase our commitment to biodiversity conservation. UPLB was the school of choice for me and my friends because we knew it is an excellent university for those who seek a career in science and engineering. UPLB values quality education. Hence, it's actively uh, pursuing quality assurance at both the program and institutional levels. A number of our pioneering and major undergraduate programs have already been certified by the ASEAN University Network Quality Assurance. We have institutionalized new UPLB graduate programs in niche areas that are designed for interdisciplinary collaboration, not only locally, but also internationally. In line with its internationalization efforts, UPLB hosts the only Philippine campus of the Nagoya University Asian Satellite Campuses Institute, where I'm currently undertaking my Doctor of Philosophy in International Development degree. Locally, we've been offering several off-campus graduate programs. We have also established our presence in Panabo City, Davao del Norte in Mindanao, through the UP Professional School for Agriculture and the Environment. I am here to study agriculture in UPLB because I believe I can learn so much in order to help my country. I think that when I finish my program and leave UPLB, I'll be better equipped to help solve the food security situation in my country. I am here because UPLB has a very good reputation and offers a course that I'm interested in. I'm taking a PhD in Extension Education which is also recognized in my country. What I especially like is that the professors are both academically very competent and supportive. The UPLB programs are relevant because these are based on the realities on the ground and were produced through a carefully thought process combining theory and practice. We champion strong disciplinal and interdisciplinary lens in understanding and providing profound solutions to complex societal problems. UPLB is known for strong research culture that informs instruction and capacity building. The Philippines and the rest of the world is facing complex challenges in food security, biodiversity loss, climate change, uh, public health, and environmental degradation. We in UPLB are always in our toes so that we can prepare and uh, provide the necessary solutions to these challenges by way of our curricular uh, programs. So what are you waiting for? Look up UPLB's 28 undergraduate degree programs or its over 100 graduate degree programs at uplb.edu.ph. File that application for admission and experience what it's like to study in UPLB. Throughout UPLB's more than 100 years of existence, it has worked in partnership with local and international organizations and institutions in the pursuit of excellence in instruction, research, and public service. Strong partnerships began when the then UP College of Agriculture and the College of Forestry, the first two colleges, established a food security program and became the home of the International Rice Research Institute. 
It was a partnership with Cornell University in the United States that made an indelible mark in the two colleges' development and history. The UPCA Cornell contract and the UP Cornell graduate education program strengthened the critical mass of professional staff in UPLB. This graduate program was responsible for producing about 56 PhDs. UP became famous in Southeast Asia. And staff development was so strong until we became UPLB with many colleges that started as huge departments of the College of Agriculture. As UPLB nurtured its traditional areas of strength, it unleashed its potentials in allied areas, growth points, and emerging fields, giving way to more partnerships and collaborations. UPLB envisions itself to be a globally competitive graduate and research university contributing to national development. As a national university whose niche programs are agriculture, forestry, environmental science, and veterinary medicine, UPLB is tasked to capacitate state universities and colleges. With integration becoming an urgent concern in the higher education arena, UPLB further intensified partnership building to enable it to collaborate in research and instruction, exchange materials, and enhance the mobility of faculty members and students. It now maintains partnerships with a significant number of regional and international educational institutions. UPLB can provide international linkages through its partners, through collaborations in research and academic programs, through student exchange programs, as well as complementation of its resources, including physical and human resources. We welcome partnerships in our niche programs from universities and institutions in the ASEAN region, as well as other countries around the world. As the higher education landscape shifts with time, UPLB will keep up by continually developing human resources, revitalizing programs for relevance, and promoting internationalization. In this highly globalized higher education arena, forming and nurturing partnerships for institutional dynamism and development is the way forward. For over a hundred years now, UPLB has nurtured a research culture that enriches instruction and enhances creativity and innovation in its faculty. This has made the university a wellspring of solutions to challenges in food security, ecological integrity, public health, and the environment. The complexity of these challenges took the university's research focus from boosting production into sustainability, the interconnectedness of man and his environment, and equitable development. Through the confluence of strengths in its niches, UPLB became a research hub in sustainable agriculture and forestry, climate change, public health, natural resources and biodiversity conservation, energy development, food and nutrition security, and disaster risk reduction. With its research partners, the university continuously contributes to knowledge and technological development in these various areas. As UPLB moves forward, more of these partnerships will take shape for the attainment of inclusive development. Aside from enriching instruction, its research tradition is aimed at making the university relevant to the life of our people through public service and extension work. This ensures the appropriateness of technologies and knowledge products and enables it to contribute to policy making and governance. Research, instruction, and public service. Each one enables the others to make the university a dynamic powerhouse that contributes to the attainment of inclusive growth and national development.
For over a hundred years now, UPLB has nurtured a research culture that enriches instruction and enhances creativity and innovation in its faculty. This has made the university a wellspring of solutions to challenges in food security, ecological integrity, public health, and the environment. The complexity of these challenges took the university's research focus from boosting production into sustainability, the interconnectedness of man and his environment, and equitable development. Through the confluence of strengths in its niches, UPLB became a research hub in sustainable agriculture and forestry, climate change, public health, natural resources and biodiversity conservation, energy development, food and nutrition security, and disaster risk reduction. With its research partners, the university continuously contributes to knowledge and technological development in these various areas. As UPLB moves forward, more of these partnerships will take shape for the attainment of inclusive development. Aside from enriching instruction, its research tradition is aimed at making the university relevant to the life of our people through public service and extension work. This ensures the appropriateness of technologies and knowledge products and enables it to contribute to policy making and governance. Research, instruction, and public service. Each one enables the others to make the university a dynamic powerhouse that contributes to the attainment of inclusive growth and national development.
the oblation, a mark of every constituent unit of the University of the Philippines, an inculcation of our hopes and aspirations for the people, and a commitment to offer our hearts for the country, imprinted on each student, faculty, staff, and alumni. Our testament to serve with honor and excellence. Founded on June 18, 1908, University of the Philippines has been mapped out in the archipelago to stay true to its mandate in providing quality and accessible higher education. Globally responsive, while staying grounded with the realities of the Filipino people to provide service that is comprehensive, people-centered, and based on extensive research and analysis. UP as the forefront of academic innovations and as the top university in the country maximizes all spaces for learning. The institution having survived wars and modernization proves its agility and preparedness to respond to any circumstance, situation, and environment. All 17 campuses has contributed in producing leaders, professionals, and principled citizens to help our communities and societies. by going with the flow, by adapting to the changing times, without forgetting where we come from. In the campus on a hill, where the fog touches the ground and the wind blows in every direction, we take the path towards lifetime learning. We learn by being perceptive of our social environment, creating and recreating. Thank you.
Philippines Baguio, the campus on a hill. A center of excellence, a nurturing space for innovation, creativity, and academic freedom. This is the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. As a constituent university of the University of the Philippines system, UPLB is a leading national higher education and research institution in various niche areas. Grounding itself on the needs of national development, UPLB cultivates well-rounded and critical leaders who are ready to lead breakthroughs and innovations. Through its industrial and academic partnerships, UPLB propagates its gains to advance inclusive development in various sectors. educational institution that upholds honor, excellence, and public service. Established on February 23, 1995, the University of the Philippines Open University is the fifth constituent unit of UP that is mandated to provide quality education through open and distance e-learning. Its campus is located in Los Paños, Laguna and is easily accessible through the Los Paños National Highway. Its landmark is the UPOU seal and the art installation called the Culture of Sharing Wisdom. Since UPOU is a fully online university, the students are not required to come to the campus. Thus, compared to its sister universities, UPOU only has a number of buildings on its campus. The first to greet UPOU campus visitors is the UPOU Community Hub. At the entrance of the UPOU campus is the Oblation Park, where the UPOU Oblation Interactive Sculpture stands. The building right after the park is the UPOU Administration Building. At the lobby of the building is the abstract condition of the oblation. The teaching and learning hub shall soon house the three faculty offices of UPOU. The Instructional Materials Development and Printing Office Building. It also has a multipurpose function room called Oblation Hall. The UPOU Multipurpose Hall. And right next to it is the Centennial Plaza, where the Centennial Marker called the Pursuit of Education is installed. Beside the plaza is the Centennial Center for Digital Learning Building. Further down the road is the newly constructed academic residences. The following buildings are under construction. The International Convention Center, the UPOU Learning Commons, and the Multimedia Center Building. Thank you. 
This is UP Diliman, the main campus of the University of the Philippines system, with 240 undergraduate programs and 402 graduate programs. The scope and range of UP's course offerings is unmatched, covering almost all disciplines and embracing all interests and inclinations. UPD has extensive alliances with international institutions of higher learning for joint academic programs, providing opportunities for curricular enhancement, faculty development, resource generation, and sharing of expertise. The university is also home to athletes in a variety of sports with 24 teams in the UP Diliman Varsity Sports Program, the College of Human Kinetics is proud to house around 400 athletes who strive to give their best as they participate and bag several awards in various regional, national, and international sports competitions. Since the start of the pandemic, UP has been making a meaningful positive impact on society from distributing alcohol-based disinfectants, opening isolation zones and a vaccination center, lending equipment for COVID-19 testing, and donating supplies for frontliners and public hospitals. This is UP Diliman. And it's not just our campus, but it's also our second home. From being a bastion of critical thinking and free speech, to a staunch advocate for social transformation and public service. To an institution that is known for its excellence in the field of science and engineering, to the music and arts. This, this is the Top QP. UP education goes beyond the borders of the university. We immerse, integrate, and take an active role in developing communities and societies, learning from one another, a bastion of principled scholars and leaders, the home of presidents, chief justices, national artists, national scientists, engineers, social scientists, lawyers, teachers, doctors, nurses, soldiers, farmers, workers, indigenous peoples, and many more.
Initiating virtual tour. And we are live! Actually, this is pre-recorded. <gasps> Hello there! You made it! Welcome to the virtual tour of the University of the Philippines, Cebu. I'm Annie, and I am a proud alumna of UP Cebu. And between just you and me, I had the best four years here in UP Cebu. I came from the College of Communication, Arts and Design, where we did not learn only the basics in journalism and other communication components, but they also taught us how to become relevant. You only have one viewer. My college is also home to the Fabrication Laboratory, where people meet and converge to use different equipment where they can fabricate things, stuff for the advancement of industrial and product design. All of this comes from the creativity of the Fine Arts program itself. Hey, Sean. Why don't you tell them more about the Fine Arts Program? The Fine Arts Program itself, founded in 1975, is the pioneer formal school in the fine arts outside the national capital. The college is also the host to nearly half a century old annual painting competition, Jose Hoya Awards, in honor of the famous national artist, Jose Hoya, and from whom UP Cebu's Jose Hoya Gallery was named after. As the campus of the premier university here in the Visayas, we have to be good. No, we have to be better or even we have to be the best. Not only in the humanities, but even in the sciences as well. Isn't that right, Sean? That's right, Annie. In 2014, UP Cebu Senvi, or the Central Visayas Center for Environmental Informatics, came up with high-resolution maps using LiDAR technology. The use of this technology by UP Cebu Senvi provided government agencies with accurate data for more precise community flood risk assessment and management. This helped local government units make informed decisions based on data science and in the process, maximizing their financial resource utilization. And in the case of the Naga Cebu landslide of 2018, UP Cebu Senvi's use of LiDAR technology allowed for one of the fastest search and retrieval operations in a disaster in the Visayas. Helping the community through the sciences is very fulfilling, but we were not just exposed to that. We were also exposed to the social sciences, from political science to psychology, and all of these concepts helped shape our mindsets to become better citizens. In fact, the, the co College of Social Sciences articulates and addresses global challenges. The college offers comprehensive and appealing programs for high school, undergraduate, and graduate students. The Master of Education program is a non-thesis graduate program designed for graduates of the Bachelor of Elementary Education or Bachelor of Secondary Education who want to pursue their professional preparation through future studies in areas relevant to teacher education. And of course, there were also budding business leaders in campus. They were the ones who had the nose for business, but had the big heart to be of service. Under the School of Management, students are not only taught to be decision makers, but the forerunners in marketing and finance. It also hones those interested in further studies of this field through its Master's in Business Administration program. Today, I am now a practicing broadcast journalist, an opinion columnist, an entrepreneur, a teacher, a better person, really. All of this because of my training and experience at UP Cebu. Nurtured to create, inspired to innovate, destined to serve. We at the University of the Philippine Cebu are driven by academic and operational excellence. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining this virtual tour. I'm so happy you took part. Oh look, Sean, a lot of people are tuning in. But the tour is over. <laughs>
Well, we'll just do it again. Ready when you are, Annie. Reinitiate virtual tour. Taking you on a tour around the campus. This is UP Diliman, the main campus of the University of the Philippines system. UP is the country's national university with its a research university, a public service university, and as a regional and global university. A university for the Filipino is, in fact, what UP best represents. Its liberal atmosphere has become a vital part of what makes a UP education and what breeds what we call Tatak UP. Today, the University of the Philippines has grown into a massive university system consisting of eight constituent universities located in 21 campuses throughout the Philippine archipelago. With 240 undergraduate programs and 402 graduate programs, the scope and range of UP's course offerings is unmatched, covering almost all disciplines and embracing all interests and inclinations. The university's faculty and graduates are likewise a major source of pride and distinction for UP. The university has produced 39 national scientists, 40 national artists, 2 national social scientists, 7 out of the 16 presidents of the republic, 15 chief justices of the Supreme Court, tens of thousands of doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers serving in the country and abroad, as well as hundreds of thousands of graduates who have become leaders in their respective fields. UP's sustained efforts to maintain its high standard of education have borne fruit in its performance in the recent World University Rankings. And among Philippine universities, UP continues to hold the top spot. And this iconic monument, the Oblation, 
embodies all the ideals that UP stands for. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, ma'am. Okay, I guess uh, we're ready to start this afternoon session. Thank you everyone for coming in early. Before we go back into uh, learning more about UPLB, we would like to invite you to experience our majestic campus virtually. So let's, let's watch this video. Center of Excellence, a nurturing space for innovation, creativity, and academic freedom. This is the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. As a constituent university of the University of the Philippines system, UPLB is a leading national higher education and research institution in various niche areas. Grounding itself on the needs of national development, UPLB cultivates well-rounded and critical leaders who are ready to lead breakthroughs and innovations. Through its industrial and academic partnerships, UPLB propagates its gains to advance inclusive development in various sectors. educational institution that upholds honor, excellence, and public service. Okay, so did you enjoy that quick tour around our campus? We hope you did, and we also hope that you'll be able to visit us physically soon. So, so now, to continue and shed light 
on the United Nations SDG on Food Security, let's all welcome the IFST team, Dr. Lotis Mapera. The virtual floor is yours. Ma'am Lotis. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Ma'am Tonette. And I hope everyone had a good lunch because this afternoon, I want to make sure that what you ate is safe because our se session for today is on food safety inside the radar of the SDG. And I hope at the end of the lecture and the workshop, you'll be able to realize the importance of food safety in sanitation, in clean water, in food security, as well as in responsible consumption. And with that, let me test your awareness on food safety by undergoing a pre-test. Kindly scan the QR code shown on your screen. And everyone, you have five minutes for this pre-test on food safety. Do not worry, this is not to gauge your overall knowledge, but just to give light on your experiences on how you relate food safety on SDG. Okay, have you all accessed the pretest? I hope you're doing well. You have four minutes. Do take note of the questions because because during the lecture, you might be able to encounter them. And remember, we do have a post test. So make sure that you listen to the lecture and participate in our workshop later. So you have three more minutes. Don't be pressured, take your time. Okay, two more minutes guys. I know some of you are might be sleepy, but <laughs> do take time. Uh, this is not, remember, this is just a test of your awareness. <laughs> we just want to wake you up because it's an after lunch activity. So normally people are normally sleepy. So
Okay, one more minute to go. Maybe some of you are done. Okay, please brace yourself for the succeeding lectures. And do think about how your experiences relate to food safety in relation to the sustainable goals. Okay, we're almost done, guys. 30 seconds to go. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you were challenged by the pretest on food safety. Now, I would like to introduce the first speaker for this afternoon. He is Professor Brian Ray Oliveros. He is Assistant Professor at the Institute of Food Science and Technology. He will talk about the basic concepts of food safety. Sir Brian, the floor is yours. Sir Brian Ray R. Oliveros. And I'm your first speaker this afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch and I hope you had a good dessert. An apple makes a good dessert, right? And as the saying goes, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But what if the apple is unsafe? I'm sure it's going to be a different story with your doctor. I'm going to talk about the basics of food safety, but first, Let's define what food safety is. Food safety is the handling, storing, and preparing food to prevent infection and to help make sure that our food keeps enough nutrients for us to have a healthy diet. In order to make sure that our food is safe, we should know the basics. So let's start. Access to safe food is a basic human right. On the other hand, unsafe food has caused and is still causing illnesses, hospitalizations, and even deaths. To reduce this, the government and other stakeholders are doing their best, but proper food preparation at the household level can also reduce the occurrence of foodborne diseases. So today, we'll discuss the five keys to safer food as advocated by the World Health Organization. But before that, let's look into the problem that we have at hand. Foodborne illness is any disease or illnesses caused by contaminated food or drink. This is a problem in both developed and developing countries. It hurts the economy, trade, and healthcare system of a country. Foodborne diseases are caused by harmful microorganisms and toxic chemicals. According to the World Health Organization, one in 10 people fall ill due to foodborne illnesses. And every year, about 420,000 die because of foodborne illnesses. That's almost half a million people, and that is very unfortunate. Children account for one third of that approximately have a million deaths. Foodborne illnesses severely affects the young, the old, the pregnant, and immunocompromised. These are high risk groups. So, what shouldn't be in their food? As mentioned a while ago, foodborne illnesses are caused by harmful microorganisms and toxic chemicals. The first cause of foodborne illnesses are harmful microorganisms. They don't change the appearance of food, but they make people sick. These so called pathogens are of primary concern in food safety, and examples of which are E. coli and Salmonella. They are ubiquitous in nature, but mostly associated with feces, insects, and pests. They result to food infection upon ingestion. 
but not all microorganisms are harmful. There are ones that ferment food like cheese, make medicine like penicillin, and those that improve our guts. There are also bad but not harmful microorganisms that make the food smell, look, and taste bad, but they don't make people sick. The second cause of foodborne illnesses are toxic chemicals. Examples are natural toxins like aplatoxins produced by some species of molds. Moreover, this could be man-made chemicals like lubricants and plasticizers that are introduced to the food or heavy metals like methylmercury and arsenic. Ingestion of toxic chemicals is termed as food poisoning. But how do these agents get into our food? Toxic chemicals and harmful microorganisms are introduced to the food by contamination. Contamination, in general, involves poor food safety practices. is the term being used. Cross-contact is the term of choice when referring to the introduction of allergens to food. The broader term contamination is used for all other agents aside from harmful microorganisms and allergens. To reduce or eliminate contamination, we should take heed of food safety. Food safety is our responsibility. It is everyone's responsibility. And yes, you could make your personal contribution to food safety. With the five keys to safer food, you can make a difference. Let's go over the five keys to food safety or safer food one by one. The first key to safer food is you need to keep it clean. Food can be cross-contaminated through your bare hands or skin, wiping cloths, equipment and utensils harboring my harmful microorganisms. Wash and sanitize your hands properly. Use soap and warm water to effectively remove dirt and bacteria. When warm water is not available, cold or lukewarm water is acceptable when used with soap. Also, wash your hands after using the toilet, after sneezing, and after touching your face, after handling raw food, after handling the trash, and even after changing a baby's diaper. Wash and sanitize the equipment and utensils that you are using during food handling. You also need to seal off insects, pests, and other animals from your kitchen as they harbor harmful microorganisms. The second key to safer food is you need to separate raw and cooked. Raw food like meat, poultry, seafood, and their juices can contain harmful bacteria. So separate raw food from other food. You can do this as early as you shop for groceries by keeping raw meat from other food. This will prevent cross-contamination. In addition, use separate equipment, utensils, and container for raw food and other food. The third key to safer food is you need to cook your food thoroughly. Proper cooking can kill almost all dangerous bacteria. Studies have shown that cooking food at a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius help ensure that the food is safe from cons contamination. To be certain of the temperature, use a food thermometer. As for soups and stews, bring it to boiling temperature. Also, when reheating cooked food, reheat it until it is hot all throughout. 
the fourth key to safer food is that you should keep food at safe temperature. To achieve this, you need to know what is the dangerous temperature or the temperature range where harmful bacteria grow best. So, what is the temperature danger zone or TDZ? TDZ is between 5 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. And at this range, harmful microorganisms love to multiply. Thus, in order to keep food safe, avoid exposing your food to TDZ. Do not leave cooked food at room temperature for more than two hours. When refrigerating the food, it should be at less than five degrees Celsius. Chilling or freezing does not kill microorganisms, but it stops or slows down their multiplication. In the same sense, when holding food before serving, keep it at a temperature greater than 60 degrees Celsius. Most harmful microorganisms do not multiply above 50 degrees Celsius. The fifth and the last key to safer food is to use safe water and raw materials. Raw materials, including water and ice, may be contaminated with harmful microorganisms and toxic chemicals. Careful selection of raw materials is very important. Hence, you water needs to be safe as it is used in washing fruits and vegetables. It is added to food, makeup drinks and ice, and used in cleaning your hands, utensils, and equipment. Moreover, use raw materials that are fresh, wholesome, processed for safety like pasteurized milk. Thoroughly wash fruits and vegetables if to be eaten raw, and also avoid raw materials that are damaged like dented canned foods. It is also very important to not use food beyond its expiry date. That's it. Those are the five keys to safer food. To end, food safety is a shared responsibility and you could do your part in this by practicing the five keys to safer food. This will stop harmful microorganisms and toxic chemicals from making you and other people sick. Again, the five keys to safer food are Keep it clean, separate raw from cooked, cook thoroughly, keep food at safe temperature, and use safe water and raw materials. It is very important to follow the five keys to safer food because proper food handling is the key to foodborne disease prevention. Now that you have the keys, use them. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's your five keys to safer food. I hope you got all those five keys and maybe you could have one or two takeaways from those five keys. Also, uh, if ever you're interested in a more detailed discussion of those five keys to safer food, you could access the resource from World Health Organization website. And I just really wanted to emphasize to everyone, to all of the participants here, is that you can make a difference in terms of food safety intervention. Uh, you have a responsibility in making our food safer because um, food safety is everyone's responsibility. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sir Brian, for that lecture no now we move on to another lecture on food safety in the value chain this will be given by our associate professor dr maria josie v somage also from the institute of food science and technology
consumers around the world. Access to safe and nutritious food is a requirement for maintaining overall health and well-being. Every day, people around the world consume thousands of food products. But where do these food products come from? And how do they get to your plate? You might have heard the phrase, farm to plate, before. Simply put, it's all the steps in the food value chain, from where food is produced to when it's eaten at your table. Food value chain is the value-adding activities from farm production, transporting, processing, distribution and consumption of processed food products. Food safety is the assurance that food will not cause harm to the consumer when it is prepared or eaten according to its intended use. The safety of food is at risk at all stages of the food chain. While most of us may have seen large food recalls of contaminated food or the latest outbreak of foodborne illnesses on the news, we usually don't think getting sick can happen to us. In the Philippines, a number of food poisoning incidents have been recorded for the past years. In 2015, at least 100 people were food poisoned after eating durian and mangosteen candy which tested positive for Staphylococcus bacteria as a result of poor manufacturing practices. Another incident was when a group of students fell ill after consuming Macapuno candy or candy made from coconut sport, which was found to be contaminated with toxic pesticide organophosphate. An estimated 600 million, almost 1 in 10 people in the world, fall ill after eating contaminated food and 420,000 die every year. Unsafe food containing harmful bacteria, viruses, parasites or chemical substances causes more than 200 diseases. Let's take a look at a simple food like fresh lettuce and follow its chain. In the good old days, maybe a local producer grows lettuce in his farm. After harvesting the full-sized lettuce, the farmer then transports and sells them to nearby towns. You may have bought some at the market and took it home for you and your family to consume. Fast forward to today, we as global consumers expect inexpensive, high-quality and nutritious foods at any time of the year, wherever we live. So those fresh produce in your local supermarkets in the middle of winter, it most likely comes from other countries around the world, passing through a series of steps in the global food supply chain to get to end consumers. And that's just for a simple vegetable. For many processed foods, that supply chain can get a lot more complicated. Baked products, for example, contain several ingredients that may have come from different countries. The global food supply chain is a highly efficient system that produces and moves food around the world. But sometimes, things could go wrong if there is lack of safety in the value chain. The lack of food safety even in one part of the supply chain can cause big problems to pop up. It may increase the risk of contamination and foodborne illnesses. In addition to the health burden, the financial burden of the individual and the industry can be heavily impacted as a result of the lack of food safety in the value chain. Some of the devastating impacts of the lack of food safety in the industry include recall of contaminated food, reduced sales and consumer demand for the implicated product or brand, loss of prestige and reputation, potential legal suits, and imposed fines by government regulators. Food can become contaminated in countless ways during its journey from farm to plate. However, most contamination falls into three different areas. During growing or pre-harvest, production or post-harvest, or final processing and handling before food is eaten or sold. When food is being grown on a farm, it may be irrigated with water unknowingly contaminated with animal waste that ran into the lake that is used for irrigation. This food is contaminated during the growing process. Food may also be contaminated with harmful chemicals when fertilizers, pesticides and other agrochemicals are used excessively. For foods of animal origin, contamination of disease causing microorganisms may occur during slaughter or shortly thereafter. Harmful bacteria such as Salmonella often colonize the intestinal tract of an animal. When the animal is slaughtered, these bacteria can contaminate the surface of the raw meat or poultry. The application of good agricultural practices is important to ensure the safety of our food during growing and production. 
These practices include proper site selection to ensure that the area is free from potential hazards. The planting material should come from approved sources to ensure its quality and safety. Proper farm management practices must be observed such as the proper use of approved fertilizers, pesticides, and other agrochemicals, proper use of personal protective equipment when applying these chemicals, and observance of proper harvest interval when using pesticide. Use of safe and quality water for spraying, washing produce and handwashing. Keeping of records of farm operations for traceability. Harvested produce must be handled carefully to avoid damage and must be stored in clean containers under the shade and not in direct contact with the soil to prevent microbiological contamination. The produce must also be secured from stray animals. Visual inspection of produce for insect pest and diseases should be done before transporting. Wash and sanitize hands before handling produce. Clean and sanitize pallets, containers or bins before using for fresh produce. Remove dirt from fresh produce outside the packing facility or area. After growing and production, farm produce is transported to warehouses for storage, or to food manufacturing plants for further processing. To keep food safe during transportation, good transportation practices must be observed. Transportation vehicle must be properly cleaned and sanitized before and after use. The vehicle must be dedicated for food only to prevent contamination. The proper temperature for the produce must be provided during transportation and receiving. Proper stacking height of produce must be observed. Workers involved in the loading, unloading, during transport, should practice good hygiene and sanitation practices. Products must only be transported together if compatible. Another common cause of food contamination occurs as a result of how food is handled before being served or purchased. For example, a busy cook starts to prepare meals early for her customers. She prepares a noodle dish first with chicken meat as one of the ingredients. She places the thawed raw meat on a chopping board. She gets busy and forgets to clean the chopping board and knife. Then she starts to prepare the salad using the same dirty chopping board and knife. After cooking the noodles and preparing the salad, she leaves them on the table for several hours and starts to cook another dish, allowing the foodborne bacteria to multiply. After preparing everything, she serves the dishes to the customers. Bon appétit! Safety in food processing can be addressed through the application of Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point or HACCP. HACCP is an internationally recognized method of identifying and managing food safety-related risk and is implemented to control risks related to the food manufacturing process. One of the prerequisite programs of HACCP is the current Good Manufacturing Practice or CGMP. This includes proper location of processing plant, sanitary design of processing plant, sanitary design of facilities such as water supply, toilet, locker rooms, garbage disposal, and sanitary design of equipment. Another prerequisite program of HACCP is the Sanitation Standard Operating Procedure or SSOP. This includes the safety of water, condition and cleanliness of food contact surfaces, prevention of cross-contamination, handwashing facilities, protection from adulterants, labeling, storage of toxic compounds, employee health conditions, and control of pests. HACCP implementation involves the assembly of a HACCP team. The team describes the product and identifies its intended use. A process flow diagram of the manufacture of the product is constructed and the process is confirmed on site. The principles of HACCP include the conduct of hazard analysis, determination of the critical control points, establishment of critical limits, establishment of a monitoring system for each critical control point, establishment of corrective actions, as well as verification procedures to determine the effectiveness of the established corrective actions. And lastly, the establishment of proper documentation and record-keeping procedures. After processing, finished products are transported to markets and retail stores for distribution to consumers.
It is important that foods are handled carefully and correctly during distribution to keep the products safe from contamination and spoilage. Good food handling practices in processed food distribution include good personal hygiene practices, proper cleaning and sanitizing of the storage and display area of processed food, proper packaging and placing in plastic pallets and not directly on the floor of the storage and display area. Follow FEFO or FIRST to expire first out. Pest control program in storage and in display area. And recall program. Consumers also play a significant role in food safety. Since other food products need further preparation before consumption, some safe practices must be observed by consumers to make safe food such as proper thawing, proper reheating, proper cooking, proper food serving, proper food storage conditions, prevention of cross-contamination, and proper hand washing and sanitization. Ensuring food safety in the value chain benefits consumers and the industry alike. Consumers are protected from the risk of foodborne illnesses and are satisfied with the safe, high quality, and nutritious foods they get. The food industry, on the other hand, will gain consumer confidence, save time and money, maximize profitability, and the business reputation is protected as they comply with the rules and regulations concerning food safety. Food safety involves everybody in the value chain. So from farm to plate, let's make our food safe. To summarize, the food value chain consists of the value-adding activities starting from the farm, transporting, processing, distribution, and consumption of the finished food products. Food safety is the assurance that food will not cause harm to the consumer when it is prepared or eaten according to its intended use, according to Codex. So therefore, food safety practices and conditions must be in place in all stages of the food value chain to prevent foodborne diseases. So as you have seen in the video, good agricultural practices, good animal husbandry practices, ensures food safety in the production of our vegetables, fruits, and food animals in the farm. Good transportation practices keep the food free from contamination when the farm produce are transported to the manufacturing plants. Hazard analysis critical control points, which is a management tool, is used to identify risk and control risk in the food manufacturing processes. Current good manufacturing practices and sanitation standard operating procedures are prerequisites to HACCP. These programs ensures that the processing environment is clean and is safe for the production of food. Good uh, handling practices are also helpful in keeping the processed food free from contamination during the distribution of the processed products in the market. But consumers also have a responsibility to observe safe food consumption practices to prevent foodborne illness. So food safety involves everybody in the food chain including you as consumer. Therefore, from farm to plate, let us make our food safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumage, for that comprehensive insight on food safety in the food value chain. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to give us a lecture on the foodborne illnesses, this event, health and wellness, let us welcome Dr. April Shane El Sulabo, Assistant Professor at IFST UPLB.
Some symptoms of potentially life threatening. Food impacts all parts of our daily lives. Not only is food essential for survival and well-being, our daily routine revolves around food, most especially on how, when, and where we get food and how we will have our meals. However, under unfavorable circumstances, certain types of food could cause diseases and even death in individuals with symptoms of diarrhea, headache, vomiting, nausea, abdominal cramps, and in worst cases, severe organ complications. According to the World Health Organization, there are 600 million people around the world suffer from foodborne diseases every year. Among these 600 million people, an average of 420,000 die each year, and one-third of these foodborne deaths occur among children under 5 years old. The organization also estimated that 33 million years of healthy lives are lost due to eating unsafe food globally each year. Foodborne disease refers to any illness that results from eating food carrying germs, parasites, toxicants, and allergens. In general, there are more than 200 diseases that we can get from eating unsafe food. These diseases can range from mild illnesses such as diarrheal diseases to severe chronic diseases such as kidney failure, neural disorders, and cancer. Furthermore, these diseases can be caused by a variety of harmful agents, including biological organisms called the pathogens. These pathogens include germs and parasites that can thrive and multiply inside the human body once they enter through food. Some of them may also produce toxins that can lead to death. Germs refers to a group of microscopic organisms that cause diseases which include bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. Examples of bacterial agents are Salmonella species and E. coli 0157H7. An example of a viral agent is hepatitis A virus. And lastly, an example of a protozoan agent that can be carried by water and food is Entemeba histolytica. Entemeba histolytica is a causative agent of amebiasis, a common infection of the human gastrointestinal tract that causes diarrhea. Foodborne parasites are organisms that live in a host and get their food from or at the expense of the host. Eating undercooked meat from infected animals is one of the main causes of parasitism in people. Examples of these parasites are tapeworms, such as tinea saginata from beef and tinea solium from pork. In addition to biological agents, certain chemicals can also cause foodborne diseases. These chemicals are toxicants, which are chemical substances that can potentially cause foodborne illness when present in substantial amounts in food. These toxicants can be naturally occurring, such as aflatoxins in peanuts, that are well known to cause cancer. Another example is scombotroxin in spoiled fish, also known as the histamine. Some toxicants can also be contributed by human activities, such as pesticides and drugs used to treat animal diseases. Another group of chemical substances that could cause foodborne disease are called allergens. An allergen is a particular substance naturally present in food, usually a protein, that can potentially cause allergic reactions. Allergens are particularly of great concern to a group of people who have sensitivity to certain food groups containing allergens. So let's have a quick activity. Which of the following food groups below can cause allergic reactions? I will give you 30 seconds to choose eight food groups by encircling your answers. Go!
so time is up. So these are the eight foods that commonly cause allergic reactions. And these are milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, wheat, fish, and shellfish. So these foods cause more than 90% of all allergic reactions in a large segment of the sensitive population. One of the most common foodborne illness that many are familiar with is food poisoning. Food poisoning is a foodborne illness usually characterized by short-term symptoms such as stomach cramps, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, fever, chills, and loss of appetite. For example, the term gastroenteritis is a short-term illness triggered by the inflammation of the digestive system, and cases of gastroenteritis can be caused by eating food containing bacteria, viruses, bacterial toxins, and parasites. Although many of the food poisoning symptoms may diminish over time, some serious complications may occur such as dehydration and organ failures that can be deadly. Some symptoms of potentially life-threatening food poisoning may include diarrhea persisting for more than three days, a fever higher than 38.6 degrees centigrade, symptoms of severe dehydration, which may include dry mouth, bloody urine, bloody diarrhea, difficulty of breathing, difficulty seeing or speaking, and severe body muscle weakness. Bacteria is by far the most prevalent cause of food poisoning. Many of these organisms are found everywhere in the environment, including soil, water, vegetation, animal farms, and even in our dirty kitchen sinks, uncleaned refrigerators and countertops. Examples of bacteria that commonly cause food poisoning are Salmonella, pathogenic E. coli, Clostridium botulinum, Listeria monocytogenes, Campylobacter jejunae, Staphylococcus aureus. Pathogens, including bacteria, can cause two types of food poisoning. The first type is infection, which refers to the ingestion of live organisms which grow and establish in the gastrointestinal tract and other tissues. Common bacteria that cause infection are Salmonella and a pathogenic type of E. coli called E. coli 0157H7. The second type of food poisoning is intoxication. Intoxication refers to the ingestion of toxins that are present in food. These toxins can be produced by certain types of bacteria. Bacterium like Clostridium botulinum produce a potent botulism toxins in meat containing canned foods. Staphylococcus aureus, a common bacterium found on the skin and noses of healthy people, also produce toxin that can cause intoxication. This bacterium can grow and produce toxins in food served in buffets. Let's have another activity. Please select the correct answer. Which of the following pathogens do not cause food infection? A. Salmonella. B. E. coli 0157H7. C. Clostridium botulinum. D. All of the above. Time is up. The correct answer is letter C. Clostridium botulinum produces toxin that cause botulism. Botulism toxin is a potent toxin that inhibits the nerve causing respiratory paralysis that can lead to death. Let's talk about one of the notorious cause of food poisoning in particular, the one you usually hear about in the news. E. coli 0157H7. In general, most strains of E. coli are harmless and found throughout nature, while the strain that causes illness like E. coli 0157H7 can be found in the intestines of healthy animals and humans. Cattle appears to be the main reservoir. E. coli usually is spread during the slaughtering process but also can get into raw milk at dairies and can even contaminate nearby vegetable or fruit crops. 
Undercooked meat and contaminated raw vegetables are the main sources of E. coli poisoning, along with person-to-person -person contact in households. An example of real-life impact of food poisoning is the story of a two-year-old Ashley Armstrong. Ashley developed a rare and extremely dangerous complication, hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. A severe complication due to E. coli 0157H7 infection linked to consumption Dole brand baby spinach in 2006. She's one of the 204 victims of the E. coli outbreak during that time. HUS is a rare but serious foodborne disease that affects the blood, blood vessels, and kidneys. It destroys the red blood cells that can lead to kidney failure. Because of this, Ashley was hospitalized for 43 days. She suffered acute kidney failure and pancreatitis and was on dialysis for nearly four months. She has a 95 to 100 percent chance of end-stage kidney disease and is expected to require a kidney transplant within three to ten years. Ashley will require a combination of kidney dialysis and transplants throughout the rest of her life. There are over 250 infectious and non-infectious agents that may contaminate food and many recognized food vehicles. Adding to the complexity of foodborne illness, Foods can become contaminated at multiple points along the food's journey from production to consumption. Hence, food safety is a shared responsibility among the key players in the food supply chain. As consumers, we also have a responsibility to protect ourselves and families from foodborne illness. This diagram illustrates the chain of events that can lead to foodborne illness. The original source of bacterial pathogens is the feces excreted by infected animals. Contamination via fecal root occurs during scalding in the slaughter route. In addition, the feces excreted by the infected animal could be recycled back to the environment and could contaminate meat facilities through dust and other vectors such as birds, flies, rodents, etc. Thus, it is important that food hygiene practices must be applied on all points of the meat chain. One of the most important strategy to protect yourself from foodborne disease is through creating hygienic conditions through three key strategies. First is prevent cross-contamination. This can be done by using clean water, utensils, and washing of hands before and after food preparation and eating. Second key is, prevent growth of germs by paying attention to storage temperature of cooked and raw food. And lastly, kill or destroy bad bugs including germs, parasites. Kill pathogens by cooking food properly as well as cleaning and sanitizing all food contact surfaces as well as storage and preparation areas. Most important to remember that to protect yourself from foodborne diseases, prevention is better than cure. Thank you very much, Mom Shane, for that insight on foodborne illnesses for, uh, in relation to good health and wellness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with our workshop for this particular segment of our session on food safety, kindly scan the QR code shown on your screen in order to access the Miro board for our workshop. If you have your Miro app, so kindly just log in to your Miro and to access this uh, Miro board for the food safety workshop for today. Okay. Uh, Dr. Salaba will be assisting me in monitoring whether you have logged in already into this into our Miro board. Ma'am Shane, do you see them logging in into the Miro board? Not yet. Okay. So please take your time, scan the QR code, or search for Miro in your browsers.
Okay, do we have access to Miro now? Okay, some of you are already seen in our Miro board. So how's the status? Okay, we're good. They're coming in. Okay, so for this particular uh, food safety workshop, uh, we will just assess or this activity is just to augment the different lectures that you learned uh, today, as well as your experiences, your everyday experiences on food safety and health and wellness. Okay, so I hope by this time you are all in the mural board and you will be answering uh, two questions that are related to food safety and the value chain, as well as uh, your experiences and how you can prevent foodborne illnesses. Okay, so you will be given 15 minutes to answer the two questions that are already posted in the mural board. Okay, at the end of the activity, uh, you can create a poster out of the different uh, ideas that you see in the mirror board. Okay, uh, remember, we are not limited to just text in this particular activity. You can also post photos or videos that you get from different sources in the World Wide Web. Okay. So feel free to answer this uh, question uh, based on your experiences, based on what you learned in today's lecture, especially number uh, letter B, okay? So there are several ways by which you can prevent foodborne illnesses. So if you had one, I hope not. Well, <laughs> I hope everybody's in a... Uh, healthy and safe but just in case you know just think about uh several ways by which you can prevent yourself from this uh foodborne diseases also being a consumer what are the different food safety uh concerns uh that you see in in your everyday life that might help you in answering our questions that are posted in our mural board. Okay, do we see some people coming in, Mom Shane? Okay. Okay, so we are monitoring the mural board and we are trying to see what are the, your insights on food safety and foodborne illnesses to your answers to the questions that were posted in your mural board. Okay, do we have some uh, insights that we can probably mention <laughs> that was given by the students? So sorry, My, I'll be reading some of them. <laughs> okay, so we have all actors in the food value chain are responsible in ensuring food security. Oh, that's a very good insight. Okay, thank you very much. And we have some more. Okay, important, especially nowadays, wash your hands, okay? Okay, we have some more. Cook food thoroughly, okay? And this even accompanied by images, okay? And okay, we have some more here. Okay, what are, okay, what are the major sources of contamination, okay? If you want to, you have to know this information so that you can prevent foodborne illness. Okay, we see some more people coming in. So just click on the post it on the left side of the mirror board and then uh, paste it on the board itself. Okay. If you have some interesting photos that you uh, have with you, okay, you can also share it on the mirror board. For those who have not uh, logged in yet into the mirror board, you can still scan the QR code. So 
Okay, there are now a lot of movement in the mural board. So several students are already putting in their inputs. Thank you very much for your active participation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Shall we mention them? <laughs> okay, shout out to Mark and Margarita. Thank you so much for being so active in the mirror board. <laughs> we encourage everyone, please log in. Okay. And. Ah, okay. Thank you so much for those Korean students. Thank you so much for your inputs. <laughs> And what else? Okay. And what are the other inputs that we have? How about some photos? Ah, okay. Okay, that's a good point. Separate raw from cooked foods. Okay, so if you are preparing at home, do not forget this very important uh, statement, okay? Especially those students who are uh, really cooking for themselves if you're staying in the dormitory, okay? So uh, one, uh, the best way to take care of yourself is to prepare your food in the most, uh, in the safest way possible. Okay, keep coming in, everyone. Okay, someone says, there's something to do in every stage of the food chain. Very true. Okay, you know that as a consumer, okay, you know that your uh, food products, they came from the farm, okay, and then it comes to you after undergoing several processes. Okay. Wow. Okay. We had a, <laughs> that is, uh, there is a good photo shown here. We have a good fridge. Okay. Someone shared a good fridge and food tracker app. Okay. So maybe everyone can access that particular app. Okay. It's a good one, especially at the household level that mm -hmm. we should learn how to practice food safety. And then from so in, so question, uh, question number, uh, so question letter B, always boil and heat raw vegetables. Okay. I think she me, uh, what she meant is to blanch. Blanch, okay. not totally boil. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, what she... Uh, okay, it's just, you know, make sure that your food is cooked at the right temperature. Mm -hmm. Make sure also that you serve your food at the right temperature. So it's very important, especially in the food service industry. Okay. In addition to the washing your hands, somebody, uh, somebody uh, posted that you need to wash your uh, raw vegetables. Okay. So that's that's cool. That's mm -hmm. uh, very very much <laughs> an application of what you learn in life. Uh, for okay. uh, for eight ways how to protect uh, yes. yourself from okay. Food so you really have to wash the vegetables because, as you know, it came from the farm. May have been contaminated with soil, which carries which carries a lot of uh, mm -hmm. microorganisms. So it's just uh, logical that you wash your vegetables thoroughly. Mm -hmm. Not to mention different chemical com contaminants that might be present. Okay. Okay. Now the mirror board is really very colorful. We see a lot of students you know, posting their insights on food safety and foodborne illnesses. Okay. Thank you so much for those who give their uh, inputs. Okay, so we have how many minutes left for this activity?
One. Okay, one minute. Okay. So just in case you want to add more to the mural board, don't worry. Okay, keep on adding them. You can do it even after this activity or this module is over. And we will just check your inputs, okay, at the end of the day, okay. Which one? Ah, there's a... Affordable thermal cameras in restaurants. <laughs> okay. Which are very good. <laughs> This is a, uh, I think, very, very timely, timely right yeah, yeah. very timely insight. Use thermal <laughs> cameras, cameras in restaurants <laughs> and when eating in the restaurants. Okay, I hope we can apply that in the Philippines as well. No? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which uh, which country actually inputted that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for those very interesting insights, our dear students or our dear participants, there. <laughs> so I think it's actually an app that will allow you to check if the food was cooked at the right temperature when eating in the restaurant, okay. Oh, there's a good one too. Avoid thermal TDC, all right. Okay. Ah, okay. So, guys, uh, for the food safety in the value chain, uh, we are waiting for your insights. Oh, more so, insights. Yeah, more insights. Actually, as a consumer, okay, maybe you have uh, encounter uh, food safety incidences, mm -hmm. or uh, you have concern about food safety as a consumer, then you can put that on that particular side of the mm -hmm. mirror board. Okay. That's good. Okay. And I see an interesting photo on what's that? Okay. PPE. Using PPE. And yeah. When preparing food. Okay. Very timely. But as you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, these practices on food safety have been there even before the pandemic so i think now it becomes more relevant mm -hmm. okay uh, i think someone someone posted about food poisoning forecast uh, they don't know if there's such a system of monitoring our food poisoning cases here in the philippines oh, so okay. somebody posted that i think putting uh what maybe an app or no, it's, a database I think, System. Surveillance. We lack surveillance ah, for food okay. poisoning cases here in the Philippines. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So that so would be a good uh, uh, point. Yeah, yeah. For, for preventing, uh, for preventing food food poisoning illnesses. Yeah. So maybe one of the participants can, in the very near future, uh, you know, develop an app yeah. to actually, there's a, uh, food poisoning. Actually, the CDC has a website for all the actually the cdc is for the u.s cases for food poisoning so in the philippines we, we do have but uh it's not really fully uh i think it's not that uh, 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 as extensive as the cdc yes. because cdc uh the u.s has uh, has has fully implemented their uh, food poisoning surveillance system okay so because the food system in the u.s is where they have a very good structure for yeah. their uh food system I hope we can emulate that in uh -huh. other parts of the world. I know other countries also have that kind of a system. Uh -huh. Okay. So I Let's think we have, more. yeah, I think we have gathered enough information from our participants so we can wrap up this activity. If you want to add more, the mirror board is still open. Yeah, until tonight, we will be monitoring your activities in the, in the mirror board. Okay, so for the next part of this session, 
uh, of course, we would like to determine whether you have you listened carefully to the lectures of our resource person. So kindly scan this QR code for our post test. Uh, you will have five minutes to do this. And after this, you can go on a health break if you're done. Okay. So thank you for uh, attending our session. And we will be looking at the different uh, inputs that you inputted in the uh, mural board. Okay, so we'll just wait for you to uh, finish the post test and uh, we will wrap up our session. Okay, thank you so much for your participation.
Okay. Thank you very much to the IFST team. That is indeed an interactive and collaborative activity. So from module three, discussing food safety is of utmost importance and having a comprehensive knowledge about it will be very helpful in achieving our goals. So again, thank you so much, IFST team. And may I present the certificate of appreciation to our speakers for module three, Okay, the Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Dr. April Shane El Sulabo, Assistant Professor, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, Ma'am Shane. Similar certificate is also awarded to Dr. Maria Josie V. Sumage, Associate Professor of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, Ma'am Josie. And to Assistant Professor Brian Ray R. Oliveros, Assistant Professor, College of Agriculture and Food Science, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you, Sir Brian. Okay, so... Um, as mentioned earlier by Ma'am Lotis, uh, we'll take this opportunity for another 10-minute health break. Again, do not disconnect. Stay connected and take your break. I will see you in a bit. Thank you. of every constituent unit of the University of the Philippines. An inculcation of our hopes and aspirations for the people. And a commitment to offer our hearts for the country. Imprinted on each student, faculty, staff, and alumni. Our testament to serve with honor and excellence. Founded on June 18, 1908, University of the Philippines has been mapped out in the archipelago to stay true to its mandate in providing quality and accessible higher education. Globally responsive, while staying grounded with the realities of the Filipino people to provide service that is comprehensive, people-centered, and based on extensive research and analysis. UP as the forefront of academic innovations and as the top university in the country maximizes all spaces for learning. The institution having survived wars and modernization proves its agility and preparedness to respond to any circumstance, situation, and environment. All 17 campuses has contributed in producing leaders, professionals, and principled citizens to help our communities and societies.
by going with the flow, by adapting to the changing times, without forgetting where we come from. In the campus on a hill, where the fog touches the ground and the wind blows in every direction, we take the path towards lifetime learning. We learn by being perceptive of our social environment, creating and recreating. Philippines Baguio, the campus on a hill. A center of excellence, a nurturing space for innovation, creativity, and academic freedom. This is the University of the Philippines Los Baños. As a constituent university of the University of the Philippines system, UPLB is a leading national higher education and research institution in various niche areas. Grounding itself on the needs of national development, UPLB cultivates well-rounded and critical leaders who are ready to lead breakthroughs and innovations. its industrial and academic partnerships, UPLB propagates its gains to advance inclusive development in various sectors. An educational institution that upholds honor, excellence, and public service. Established on February 23, 1995, the University of the Philippines Open University is the fifth constituent unit of UP that is mandated to provide quality education through open and distance e-learning. Its campus is located in Los Paños, Laguna and is easily accessible through the Los Paños National Highway. Its landmark is the UPOU seal and the art installation called the Culture of Sharing Wisdom. Since UPOU is a fully online university, the students are not required to come to the campus. 
Thus, compared to its sister universities, UPOU only has a number of buildings on its campus. The first to greet UPOU campus visitors is the UPOU Community Hub. At the entrance of the UPOU campus is the Oblation Park, where the UPOU Oblation Interactive Sculpture stands. The building right after the park is the UPOU Administration Building. At the lobby of the building is the abstract condition of the Oblation. The Teaching and Learning Hub shall soon house the three faculty offices of UPOU. The Instructional Materials Development and Printing Office Building. It also has a multipurpose function room called Oblation Hall. The UPOU Multipurpose Hall. And right next to it is the Centennial Plaza, where the Centennial Marker called the Pursuit of Education is installed. Beside the plaza is the Centennial Center for Digital Learning Building. Further down the road is the newly constructed academic residences. The following buildings are under construction. The International Convention Center, the UPOU Learning Commons, and the Multimedia Center Building. This is UP Diliman, the main campus of the University of the Philippine System, with 240 undergraduate programs and 402 graduate programs. The scope and range of UP's course offerings is unmatched, covering almost all disciplines and embracing all interests and inclinations. UPD has extensive alliances with international institutions of higher learning for joint academic programs, providing opportunities for curricular enhancement, faculty development, resource generation, and sharing of expertise. The university is also home to athletes in a variety of sports, with 24 teams in the UP Diliman Varsity Sports Program, the College of Human Kinetics is proud to house around 400 athletes who strive to give their best as they participate and bag several awards in various regional, national, and international sports competitions. Since the start of the pandemic, UP has been making a meaningful positive impact on society from distributing alcohol-based disinfectants, opening isolation zones, and a vaccination center, lending equipment for COVID-19 testing, and donating supplies for frontliners and public hospitals. This is UP Diliman. And it's not just our campus, but it's also our second home. From being a bastion of critical thinking and free speech, 
to a staunch advocate for social transformation and public service. To an institution that is known for its excellence in the field of science and engineering, to the music and arts. This, this is the QP. UP education goes beyond the borders of the university. We immerse, integrate, and take an active role in developing communities and societies, learning from one another, a bastion of principled scholars and leaders. The home of presidents, chief justices, national artists, national scientists, engineers, social scientists, lawyers, teachers, doctors, nurses, soldiers, farmers, workers, indigenous peoples, and many more. Okay, so once again, uh, welcome back. Uh, we will now proceed on the last module that will discuss the importance of eating healthy and, sustain and sustainably. The virtual floor is yours, Dr. Amy Sherry Baryon. Ma'am Sherry. Hello, everyone. Okay. Uh, we are the nutrition team from the Institute of Human Nutrition and Food, College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Let me introduce the members of the group, starting with our team leader, Ms. Anne Cayetano. Ms. Anne is an assistant professor from the Nutritional Sciences Division. Next, we have Ms. Lisel Atienza. Ms. Lisel is an associate professor also from the Nutritional Science Division, and she is the current assistant to the director. Then we have uh, Ms. Sheila Abakan, an assistant professor from the Food Management and Administration Division. Also from the same division, we have um, our chef in the house, Mr. Von Ryan Ebron, also an assistant professor. And yours truly, my name is Amy Sherry A. Barion, the present uh, director and professor. So I hope that you will enjoy the module and activities lined up specifically for you. Have a great day. Thank you and happy learning. Thank you, Dr. Baryon. Before we start the first activity for this module, kindly accomplish the pretest via Google form. The link is flashed on the screen and can also be found in the chat box. You are given five minutes to answer. So to our, our attend, attendees and participants, your time starts now.
Now that you've answered the pretest, are you now ready for our first activity? Send any reactions to signify your that you are all set. So, all right, looks like that you are ready. So for the introduction, we will be discussing the current situation of the Philippines in terms of nutrition and the key programs specified in the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition. I'm turning you over now to Assistant Professor Sheila Abakan. Thank you, Dr. Barion. In a few minutes, you will see a quick video presentation in which you will be acquainted with a number of food, nutrition, and health-related indicators, as well as an overview of the programs being implemented to address malnutrition problems in the Philippines. But before I show you that, let me share with you first about some basic nutrition terminologies. Nutrition is basically the science of foods and the nutrients and other substances which they contain. So it is about food components action within our body, starting from ingestion, the process of digestion, absorption, the metabolism of the nutrients, and of course, excretion. From food, we get the necessary nutrients which are used in the body to provide energy, structural materials, and regulating agents to support growth, maintenance, and repair of the body's tissues. On a bigger perspective, nutrition is a critical part of health and development. Better nutrition is related to improved infant, child, and maternal health, better immune systems, safer pregnancy and childbirth, and lower risk of non-communicable diseases. Next, what is malnutrition? The word mal means bad or abnormal. So malnutrition is a in a basic sense is a condition of having bad or poor nutrition. In particular, malnutrition refers to deficiencies, excesses, or imbalances in an individual's intake of energy and or nutrients. And it exists in many forms, like in the photos here. Also, having bad nutrition can be manifested and be assessed in various ways. One can be malnourished by having higher or lower weight than what is expected, expected for an individual's age or height. Moreover, um, deficiency in micronutrients is also one of the common malnutrition problems worldwide. Let's talk about undernutrition. Undernutrition makes people, the children in particular, much more vulnerable to disease and health. There are four broad sub forms of undernutrition, particularly when we are talking about children. So these are the following, wasting, stunting, and underweight. And also deficiencies in vitamins and minerals in which um, infants, pregnant and lactating mothers are more susceptible to. Having a low uh, or lower weight than what is expected based on height is called as wasting. So it usually indicates recent and severe weight loss maybe because a person has not had enough food or uh, they have had an infectious disease such as diarrhea, which has caused them to lose weight. On the other hand, having a shorter height than what is expected for a certain age is known as stunting. It is the result of chronic or recurrent undernutrition, usually associated with poor socioeconomic conditions, poor uh, maternal health and nutrition, frequent illness, and or inappropriate infant and young child feeding and care in early life. Spunting holds children back from reaching their physical and cognitive potential. Children with low weight for age are known as underweight. And a child who is underweight may be stunted, wasted, or even both. Inadequacies of 
intake of vitamins and minerals, or what we refer as micronutrients, is also a form of undernutrition. The function of these micronutrients is to enable the body to produce enzymes, hormones, and other substances, which are vital for proper growth and development. According to the World Health Organization, iodine, vitamin A, and iron are the most important in global public health terms. Their deficiency represents a major threat to the health and development of populations worldwide, particularly children and pregnant women in low-income countries. In the picture, dizziness or lightheadedness is one of the symptoms of having iron deficiency anemia. Now, let's move to the other side of the spectrum. Overnutrition happens when the body receives excess nutrient or energy, which is commonly measured in terms of calories. Overweight and obesity is the condition when a person is too heavy for his or her weight. Consequently, the excessive fat accumulation in a person can negatively affect his or her Diet-related non-communicable diseases or NCDs include um, cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks and stroke and often link with high blood pressure. So it also include um, certain cancers such as colon, breast, kidney cancers, and of course, diabetes. Unhealthy diets and poor nutrition are among the top risk factors for these diseases globally. Now, every country in the world is affected by one or more forms of malnutrition. And in the following video, you will know the scope of the malnutrition problems in the Philippines and who are the most commonly affected groups. Hi, in this video, we'll answer the following questions. What is the current state of nutrition in the Philippines? What is the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition? And what are the key programs specified in PIPAN? First, what is the current Philippine nutrition situation? Based on the results of the National Nutrition Survey of FNRIDOSD in 2018, triple burden of malnutrition still exists among all age groups. Among children less than 2 years of age, stunting prevalence remains high and doubles at 1 year of age, coinciding the transition to complementary feeding period. Anemia prevalence is also high, specifically among infants 6 to 11 months. Exclusive breastfeeding among 0 to 5 months old significantly improved in a span of 7 years, but the rate of breastfeeding exclusively until 5.9 months remains low. Young children meeting the minimum acceptable diet is very low, particularly among infants 6 to 11 months, thus complementary feeding remains suboptimal. Among preschool children, stunting and underweight remains to be of high magnitude. 3 out of 10 preschoolers are stunted, while 2 out of 10 are underweight. Overweight is also becoming a problem as the child grows older. For this age group, a decreasing trend in anemia prevalence was observed with a slight increase from 2013 to 2018 and was considered a mild public health problem. Among school-age children, stunting and underweight is still a public health problem of high severity, while overweight is also a growing problem for this age group. 2 out of 10 school-age children are underweight or stunted, while 1 out of 10 is overweight or obese. Anemia prevalence increased in 2018 for school children, affecting most of the 6 years old with moderate severity. Among adolescents, stunting has decreased significantly from 31.9% to 26.3%, while wasting has also decreased but not significantly. 
Similar with wasting, overweight is also a growing problem as 1 out of 10 are either wasted or overweight or obese, while 2 out of 10 of adolescents are stunted. Anemia also remains a problem of mild public health significance, especially among females 13 to 19 years old. Among adults, chronic energy deficiency significantly declined at 8%, while overweight and obesity are increasing from 31.1% to 37.2%. Android obesity also increased based on waist circumference and waist to hip ratio. Anemia is of mild public health significance with 8.3 prevalence. Anemia prevalence is still higher among women than men and in rural communities than in urban. Prevalence of adults having elevated blood pressure significantly declined from 23.9% to 19.2% while prevalence of high fasting blood sugar among adults increased from 5.6% to 7.9%. For non-communicable disease risk factors, smoking among adults further declines to 20.7%, while more than half of current drinkers are engaged in binge drinking. Physical inactivity did not change at 41% proportion among adults. Among elderly, chronic energy deficiency significantly declined, but overweight and obesity is increasing as well as android obesity. Prevalence of anemia is of moderate public health significance, while prevalence of iodine deficiency disorder based on urinary iodine excretion had decreased. But prevalence of excessive iodine intake of more than 300 micrograms per deciliter had increased. Prevalence of elevated blood pressure significantly declined among elderly, but high fasting blood sugar had increased. For non-communicable disease risk factors, smoking further declines, but 4 in every 10 elderly are engaged in binge drinking. Half of the elderly population are also physically inactive. In terms of food consumption, the mean one-day Filipino intake remained to be mainly of rice, vegetables, and fish and products. Filipinos have a total intake of 3,072 grams, 39% from cereals and products, 15% from vegetables, 11% from fish and products, 8% from meat and products, 6% from milk and products, and 5% from fruits. The average daily household food cost is $5.8 with top consumption for meat and products, cereals and products, vegetables, milk and products, eggs, fruits, sugars and syrups, and fats and oils. The quality of Filipino diet was persistently inadequate in macro and micronutrients without meeting the 100% energy adequacy. Now, what is PIPAN? PIPAN stands for the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition. It is the country's blueprint for nutrition programs for a period of six years. The most recent PPAN is PPAN 2017 to 2022, consisting of 12 programs and 46 projects, serving as a framework for actions that could be undertaken by member agencies of the National Nutrition Council, other national government agencies, local government units, non government organizations, academic institutions, and development partners. Among the 12 programs, 8 are nutrition-specific, 1 is nutrition-sensitive, 
and three are enabling programs. For the nutrition-specific programs, it includes infant and young child feeding, integrated management of acute malnutrition, national dietary supplementation program, and national nutrition promotion program for behavior change. Other nutrition-specific programs include micronutrient supplementation, mandatory food fortification technology development, capacity building, regulation and monitoring and promotion, nutrition in emergencies, and overweight and obesity management and prevention programs. For the nutrition-sensitive programs, it includes farm-to-market roads and child nutrition, target actions to reduce poverty and generate economic transformation and child nutrition, coconut rehabilitation program, gulayan sa paaralan or school vegetable gardening, and diskwento caravans in depressed areas. In addition, nutrition-sensitive programs include family development sessions for child and family nutrition project, mainstreaming nutrition in sustainable livelihood, public works infrastructure and child nutrition, adolescent health and nutrition development, and salin tubig and other programs on water, sanitation, and hygiene. Lastly, enabling programs include mobilization of local government units for nutrition outcomes, policy development for food and nutrition, and strength and management support to the PPAN 2017 to 2022. Of course, all of these plans and programs will not be achieved without the commitment of every individual Filipino. Until next time! Okay, so that's it for Activity 1. Hope you will remember some of the information given. If you have questions, kindly chat them in the chat box and we'll answer them later. For Activity 2, I'm turning you over to Assistant Prof. Ann Caetano for the introduction to the principles of healthy eating. Thank you very much, Ma'am Abakan, for that wonderful activity. So for this activity, we're going to play a game, specifically an escape game. So are you familiar with this type of game? Let me see some reactions first or any chat. Are you familiar? All right. So some of you may have been, um, may have watched the movie on escape game or some of you may have played it um, in some establishments. But for um, everyone's um, information, let's have this, the rules for the game. All right, so here are the rules of the game. As in the, um, is, as in the case of many escape rooms, you are locked in this game and your objective is to escape within 15 minutes by solving puzzles or questions. This game actually contains two rooms for you to escape and which means that you will need two sets of codes. So you may click around the room or you may click the show interactive elements icon at the right upper right corner of your screen to show the clickable items. So once escaped, you may post a screenshot and use hashtag APRU2021 and hashtag healthy eating. So don't worry because we will also be playing the game simultaneously with you and give you hints on the locations of the codes. From time to time, we can also ask you for questions or answers to the puzzles and questions. So are you ready? Let me see some reactions first. Are you ready? The link to the game is now flashed on your screens and also in the chat box. All right. Thank you for your reactions. So if you are ready, let's play the game. The timer, your 15 minutes will start now. I am also sharing my screen for you to see. So if you are ready, click play.
All right, so it's already past noon, but you're just waking up. So better get going. You don't want to be late for your appointment. Do you need to get up or do you want to sleep for five more minutes? I know you want to sleep more, but let's get up. All right, so this is your room. You may click around or you may click this button here to show the clickable items. All right, so let's see. Let's click on your computer. So let's wait for this to turn on and remember to come back later. Let's go outside your bedroom. Again, you have the clickable item, so you may curate your own experience. But in order to go out, you need to get your keys. So find your keys. Maybe it's one in the cabinets. It's one of the cabinets. Is this, is the key here? No, it's just some soda. Let's see, is it here? No, it's just some coffee. Last try. All right, I think this drawer contains the key, but you need a four-digit code. And the hint is you need to find four digits. All of them are in red font. And when you input them, input them in increasing, in increasing order. So remember, sharing is caring. So you may chat the numbers that you've found in the chat box and put them all together so you can escape together. Let's play the TV here. any number yet remember you may share so you can escape together i've found one here again the code is in red font so one of the codes is number six Remember also that you need to go back to your bedroom because there's another monitor here.
Let me stop this now. You already have the code. Very good, students. So let's input one, three, six, and nine. Let's see. Oh, there's the, our key. Okay. So let's get it. We got our keys. We can now go outside. Yay. Welcome to Dishing Up Nutrition All right, so with licensed nutritionists and dietitians from. And we need to go to the consultation section. Oh, so the doctor is running late. So it looks like we have to wait. Let's sit here. Oh no, did you fall asleep? Is there an earthquake? Let's open your eyes. Oh, you see the light. Let's go into the light. No, it's not an earthquake. They're actually taking you somewhere. I think you're in the basement of the hospital. There's no way to go but inside. All right, let's go inside. So as you can see, there are six rooms here. The first room in the um, at the right side is the back button. Let's see the first um, room on the left. So you have two clickable items. Oh, this isn't a question. So how many food pyramids are there? You only have two choices, five or seven. Based on the video that you've watched, How many food pyramids are there? Well, let's maybe we can go back later. What is this? This is an infographic on understanding hunger and malnutrition. So you may read more on this. Let's go back. Let's try the other rooms. Maybe I, we you, we can go outside the window. No, the windows are stuck. And actually, there are grills on them. You can't go outside. The third room, oh, it's the exit. So you're going to need another set of four-digit code. And again, they are increasing. So for the first room, you already have the five or seven. You need to choose between the two. Five or seven. Let's check the last two rooms. So there's another puzzle here. Fishes are rich in omega-3 and omega blank fatty acids. So these are your polyunsaturated fatty acids. Omega-3 and omega what? You can help each other. You may chat the answers. What do you think is the number here? There's another puzzle. It is recommended to drink at least six to blank glasses water a day. So how many glasses? Can we see some answers for this one? I think this one is um, somehow you're familiar with this one. Wow, someone has already gotten all the codes. Let's see. Let's see if it is correct. Yay, very good. That's the correct code. All right, so let's let's go home. Welcome to Dishing Up Nutrition. I, uh, I've never been glad to be home.
So do you want to go outside again and be locked in the hospital? Or do you want to watch TV? Of course, you want to chill and watch TV. All right, so you may still play. You still have two more minutes. For those who are not yet done playing, may still click around. Hi students, it's actually game over. So for those who escaped, congratulations. Give yourselves a round of applause. So for those who are um, that, not that unfortunate to escape, don't worry, you may still play the game, um, escape game anytime, um, multiple times. And share what you've learned to your family and friends that you really care about. So just to summarize, as you can see at the start of the game, you can see that um, the player has poor diet quality as evidenced by the inconsistent meal pattern, the consumption of a lot of carbonated beverages and chips, and um, the overuse of supplements. So the effect of this diet quality is actually um, evidenced by the player ha having to have um, hospital appointments, and due to non-stop symptoms such as headaches. So we hope that especially now with the pandemic, you will start to take care more of yourselves and choose to consume healthier foods and beverages, enough water to strengthen your immune system. And of course, please apply the principles of healthy eating, which are variety, moderation, and balance. Okay, so we hope that you've enjoyed the game and learned from it. Now for the activity three, you will be introduced to the principles of sustainable preparation and consumption and to the Philippines national dish adobo. With that, let me turn you over to Assistant Professor Von Ryan Ebron. Thank you for that, ma'am. Now for activity three, we are going to have a lecture on sustainable consumption and then show you a cooking demo on how to prepare the Philippine national dish adobo and adobo a version with the dish. preparation and consumption. This talk has five parts. Introduction, current issues, targets, what you can do, and lastly, take-home messages. Sustainability ensures the needs of the present times are met without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own. So what we put on our plates has a very big impact on the environment. Sustainable diets actually protect our ecosystems. It is culturally acceptable, it is accessible, economically fair, and affordable. It is nutritionally adequate, safe, and healthy. Ultimately, it optimizes natural and human resources. Sustainable preparation and consumption is a vital part in achieving UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which is a roadmap on how to transform our planet where everyone can live in peace, prosperity, and dignity. Sustainable preparation and consumption also promote economic growth, resource efficiency, poverty alleviation, environmental protection, and sustainable lifestyles. Sustainable production and consumption imply an increase in the shares of plant-based foods and of home-cooked meals. On an individual level, several factors affect how people prepare and consume food. Some of these factors include food habits and preferences, age, education, income, physiological needs, cultural traditions, norms, and fashion, personal food experience and exposure, time and work patterns, household decision-making, family type, and availability and accessibility of food. The alarming increase in the human population is a major challenge in achieving sustainability. Based on estimates, 
the global population will reach 9.6 billion by 2050, and this will require an equivalent of almost three planets to provide the natural resources needed to sustain current lifestyles. It's sheer an estimate one third of all food produced, which is equivalent to about 1.3 billion tons, worth around one trillion dollars, ends up rotting in the bins of consumers and retailers, or spoiling due to poor transportation and harvesting practices. A significant share of total energy inputs is embedded in these losses. Unsustainable diets arise from industrialization, globalization, the dietary shift towards animal-based and processed food, economic disparity, and food insecurity. For instance, only 0.5% of the world's total water is available for human needs. The infrastructure needed to clean and deliver water to households is also expensive. The food sector accounts for about 30% of the world's total energy consumption and accounts for around 22% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Now, humans depend on the generosity of nature, but humans are doing a very poor job in protecting it. Here are the four main targets in order to achieve the responsible consumption and production for the SGD by 2030. Number one is food for all. To have enough safe, quality, and nutritious food available and accessible to present and future generations. Second, reduce per capita global food waste by half at the retail and consumer levels and reduce food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses. Third, ensure that people everywhere have the relevant information and awareness for sustainable development and lifestyles in harmony with nature. Fourth, Substantially reduce waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse. What you can do. Here are some simple yet effective tips on how you can start being responsible consumers and producers. Plan your meals. Right choice of ingredients. Proper meal composition. Efficient use of resources. And minimize food waste. Plan your meals. You can start adopting sustainable practices gradually by planning your meals. This can be done by following a budget and planning ahead of time for efficient use of your resources. For example, about buying, batch preparation, and efficient storage practices. In planning, you, you should observe the following. Source ingredients from your own backyard. Use fresh, in-season, and locally sourced ingredients. Adopt plant-based diets and lessen incorporating animal meat. Use of energy-efficient storage and cooking equipment and practices. Incorporate portion size moderation and plans for utilization of leftovers and trimmings. And packaging and other paraphernalia in serving should not be disposable. Right choice of ingredients. Growing your own food is a very sustainable food system practice. This will reduce the food miles or the carbon footprint of procuring your fresh produce. This practice will help you save money and it gives you a greater connection on how food is grown. Prioritize buying food with ethical features. Examples are local, seasonal, ethically produced, organic, from short supply chain. This practice has benefits such as usually these crops have the best conditions of sensory characteristics, nutritive value, and safety. Shorter farm to fork food path which saves on other resources cheaper than buying from a wholesaler, and allows for better negotiations. Lower packaging waste and nutritional losses. Supports the local economy and helps sustainability consciousness in the community. This illustrates where you are recommended to buy. As much as possible, buy directly from the growers, producers, or farmers. Right choice of ingredients. Reduce the use of animal meat, especially beef and dairy products in dishes, since production of these have higher negative impact on the environment than plants. Fortunately, plant-based food items are rapidly gaining popularity. Avoid processed snacks or ready-made foods rich in sugar, sodium, and trans fat. Read the best before date, ingredients list, and nutritional information of the food labels if possible. This will help you get better options. Focus on whole, minimally processed foods. This food contain minimal to no added sugar, sodium, and trans fat. In oils, choose healthier oils such as those derived from olive, safflower, soybean, sunflower, etc. 
for imported goods, substitute it with local alternatives. Ask questions regarding the food you are buying. As a consumer, you have the power to avoid purchasing items that don't fit your environmental and ethical standards. This figure shows how resource-intensive are animal-based foods as compared to plant-based foods. Proper meal composition talks about adequacy, variety, balance, and moderation. Adequacy. Consume what your body needs and it should favor nutrient-dense foods, especially those that contain essential nutrients per calorie. Variety involves the eating different foods from each food group or to get all the needed nutrients by the body. For balance, it refers to the balance between energy intake and expenditure aside from consuming a balance of all the different food groups. Moderation. Regulate food intake, especially in the consumption of sugars, fat, salt, or sodium, and alcoholic beverages. Proper meal composition should be guided by the following recommendations. Use whole and intact grains such as whole grain, bread, brown rice, and whole grain pasta. Refined carbohydrates only in small amounts and less often. More on fruits and vegetables and less animal-based food. Add nuts and legumes for its flavor, plant protein, and effect of increased satiety. Include poultry and eggs in moderation for healthier protein with a far lower environmental footprint than red meat. More kinds of seafood, more often for essential fatty acids. Refrain from processed foods rich in sugar, sodium, and trans fat. Cut the salt or MSG. Start working with spices, herbs, citrus, and other aromatics for flavoring. Prioritize water over any other beverages. Avoid eating more than needed, less than dining out. Especially avoid buffet and eat all-you-can restaurants. Efficient use of food ingredients. This can be achieved by apply minimal to no cooking if possible, make food from scratch as much as possible, choose the appropriate mode of food preparation and cooking, ensure the right temperature in cooking meat, poultry, and fish, consider the quantity of each ingredient to obtain a specific number of servings, Properly store foods so as to best preserve it. Follow first-in, first-out principle. Be flexible when following recipes to utilize available ingredients. Use leftovers to create another meal. Efficient use of time, energy, water. Tips are as follows. Cut food in smaller sizes, if possible, for faster cooking. Use the right size burner to save energy. Use an electric kettle to jump start hot water to be used in cooking. Use the residual heat to finish off the cooking process. Cook more quantities if possible. This can be used for other, another meal. In baking, skip reheating if possible. Avoid too much opening of pot cover and oven door during cooking. Use pressure whenever possible to lessen cooking time and energy use. When possible, use only one or two equipment for majority of the work. Avoid overstacking the cold storage units. Do not store hot foods in refrigerators right away. Replace outdated kitchen appliances with energy-efficient models. Use the right size and type of kitchen equipment relative to the kitchen size. Cleaning and regular maintenance of all kitchen equipment. Turn off kitchen equipment when not in use. Save water at all costs. Minimize and managing waste are key concerns in attaining sustainability. Food waste refers both to food left on the plate and the food trimmings during dish preparation. Food waste reflects poor cost management and contribution to carbon emissions and methane gas produced from landfill decomposition. Preventing food waste equates to savings. Always remember that disposal should be your last resort. Here are some ways to minimize food waste. Proper menu planning from the start is the key to waste prevention. Leftovers and trim-offs should be considered to be used in crafting other dishes. Learn to use parts of fruits and vegetables that people normally throw away. Donate excess food. Moderation of portion or serving size. Emphasize quality over quantity. Buy only what is needed and will be used. Ensure proper storage of ingredients to avoid spoilage. Follow first in, first out rule. Extend shelf life by vacuum packaging freezing, and marinating meat and vegetables. Track the source and amount of food waste to implement appropriate actions. For the inedible food scraps, consider making compost for food gardens or landscapes and recycle packaging waste. 
So what have we learned so far? Let's recap. Our food choices impact not just ourselves, but also the environment. Achieving sustainable preparation and consumption requires collaborative efforts across sectors. It should start with us. Supply and demand work both ways. A shift in the food production landscape depends on a shift in our diets. What's good for the planet is good for us too. Share and educate your family and friends about sustainable preparation and consumption. Thank you and here are the references that you can look at. Hi, I'm Chef Ian and I'm an assistant professor at the Institute of Human Nutrition and Food at UP Las Vegas. I'll be showing you how to cook two dishes. First is adobo sapoti or braised pork and chicken in vinegar and carne. The second one is a vegetable adobo. Adobong kangkong na may tokwa at kabuti. Or stir fry water spinach with tofu and steered oyster mushrooms. But first, a short history on adobo. In the book, Libro de Cucina by Roberto Nila, written in 1521, a Spanish chef and culinary scientist, Borja Sanchez, found that the Filipinos have been eating adobo even before the Spaniards came to the Philippines. He gave a lecture entitled Adobos, Vinegars, and Other Cultural Connections Between the Philippines and Spain at the Ateneo de Manila University. Pedro de San Buenaventura, Spanish friar, was the first to call adobo what it is in his book, Vocabulario de Lengua Tagala, in 1613. The Filipino native's adobo was kilaw, which means to cook or marinate meat in vinegar or acid. This was referred by San Buenaventura as the native adobo. Filipinos were using and preserving carabao meat in vinegar back then. That is why adobo sa puti has been considered by some purists as the classic adobo, using only vinegar, spices, and garlic. Soy sauce was introduced by the Chinese later on and is now commonly used in adobo making. Adobo has many variations as the number of islands in the Philippines. We practically adobo everything from meats, seafood, to different vegetables. We use soy sauce, coconut cream, and various spices. We also have adobo flakes, which are pork or chicken adobo, shredded and fried to create the savory, crispy flakes. Back to our recipe, adobo sa Here are the ingredients. One and a half cups vinegar, three bowls of garlic, you can use less, salt, three to five pieces bay leaves, one kilogram chicken, one kilogram pork spare ribs, cracked black pepper, two cups of water. Don't forget part of your mise en place. Place a wet towel under your chopping board to prevent it from slipping. Use sharp knives and always prepare a bowl or container as your trash bin for convenience. For your marinade, peel and crush your garlic. Season your meats with salt and pepper. with crushed garlic and vinegar for one hour. Strain the meats and heat up your pan until it's hot enough. Brown your meats on both sides. Browning creates flavor. After browning all meats, put them back in the pan and add your marinade. Pull garlic cloves, bay leaves, and water. Bring it up to a boil and once the chicken are cooked, remove them from the pan to prevent them from overcooking. Continue to cook the pork and allow the water to evaporate. Add back the cooked chicken and coat them with the sauce. Simmer for a couple of minutes to allow the chicken to absorb the sauce. Then turn off the heat. Let's plate! Pile up some meat to create height. Add some of the nice and soft garlic cloves all over the plate and drizzle with the sauce. 
if you want more sauce, you can stop reducing the sauce halfway through. Some versions fry or grill the meat after the braising process. Top with our thinly julienne onions and some pickled vegetables to give some sweetness and depth and flavor. And finish with some fresh cilantro. Here's our adobo sapoti. On to our next recipe, stir fry water spinach with tofu and seared oyster mushrooms. Let's prepare our mise en place. Let's make garlic chips from two cloves of garlic. Six cloves of garlic chopped. One medium sized onion, julienne. Cube the tofu. Finally, julienne, some ginger. Gather and cut the leaves of the water spinach. And blanch them in hot water. You can use ice water to stop the cooking process after blanching. Heat the pan with oil for frying. For our garnishes, fry some onions. Garlic chips. And some ginger. Set them aside for later. Heat up a separate pan and add some oil. When it's smoking hot, add your oyster mushrooms and brown them. Season with salt and pepper. Set them Fry the tofu until crispy and golden brown. Once done, set aside. Okay, here are the ingredients. Fried tofu, fried garlic chips, seared oyster mushrooms, Fried ginger, fresh ginger, fried onions, fresh onions, julienne, chopped garlic, water spinach, cornstarch, salt, vinegar, soy sauce, water, black pepper, and oil. Now we're ready for the stir fry. Smoking hot pan with a little bit of oil, you should take your ginger. Onions, and garlic, a little bit more oil, and we add in our Black spinach. A little bit more oil. We 
have in our vinegar, about two tablespoons. And one tablespoon of spices. Add some salt and pepper. A little bit more salt. Lower the flame. Uh, we'll make a little bit of sauce into it. So I have corn starch here. Add a little bit of water. Dissolve the cornstarch into the water to make a slurry. Then, in a, in a hot pan with the vegetables, you add a little bit of it. And add a little bit more water. We just want to wet it a bit with the sauce. We add in our fried tofu. We mix it in the vegetables and the sauce. So the tofu will be coated with the sauce. Or your adobos. Just to put some glaze into it. There you go. And you're done. Plate. Okay, stack on some vegetables or the spinach at the bottom. Place some tofu around it. Seared mushrooms, reduce as garnish. And then our Right, and the onions, some garlic, fried garlic, and our fried chicken. I added the fried garnishes to add some texture and flavors. Here's our adobong gangkong na may tokwa at kabute. I hope you'll try cooking both dishes wherever you are. Okay, that's it for activity three and then motion four. So thank you for joining us and back to you, Ma'am Lizelle. Thank you, Sir Ebron. Thank you, Sir Ebron. I hope that you enjoyed our activities for this module. For us to measure your learnings for this module, kindly answer the post-test. The link is now flashed on your screen and is available in the chat box. Again, you have five minutes to answer it. Your time starts now.
Okay, and that caps off our module. To summarize, in Activity 1, we learned about the forms of malnutrition and the current Philippine nutrition situation. Also, the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition, which somehow reflects the nutrition problems and corresponding strategies employed by other similar countries. For Activity 2, we understood the principles of nutrition and tips of healthy eating that may help us prevent nutritional problems. And for Activity 3, we learned about the techniques in achieving sustainable preparation and consumption and how we can apply this in our everyday lives. With all this, we hope that we spark your interest towards healthy and sustainable eating. We also hope that you will share these learnings to the people that you really care about. Thank you very much, everyone, and keep safe. Okay, thank you very much, Ma'am Amy. Uh, that was really a, a nutritious treat for all of us. Uh, we just miss the smell, the, the scent of the cooking, and the delicious taste of the uh, adobo, adobo sa puti, and the stirred fried uh, vegetables from Chef Ian. Okay, let me present our certificate of appreciation to our speakers for cluster uh, for module four. Okay. So our Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Assistant Professor Sheila F. Abakan, Assistant Professor of the College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, Ma'am Sheila. Okay, next. Okay, similar Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Dr. Lizelle M. Achenza, Associate Professor of the College of Human Ecology, um, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you, Ma'am Lisel. And uh, we also have a certificate of appreciation awarded to Dr. Amy Sherry Barion, Professor of Food and Nutrition, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thanks, Ma'am. And certificate of appreciation is awarded to Assistant Professor Ann Cayetano, um, Assistant Professor of Institute of Human Nutrition and Food, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you, ma'am. And finally, our Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Assistant Professor Von Ryan M. Ebron, Chef and Assistant Professor of the Institute of Human Nutrition and Food, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you, Chef. Okay, to wrap up our activity for today, so let me recap what has happened throughout the day five workshop. Today's session was opened by Director Aimee Sue Martinez and AVP Wendell Capilli. Our UPLB Chancellor, Dr. Jose V. Camacho Jr. welcomed us to this event and provided us with his insights on how we can further our goals in this ULP 2021 to achieve a food and nutrition rich region. Chancellor Camacho also encouraged everyone, especially our youth leaders, to explore ways on how they can take part in helping address food and nutrition security. Then we had a chance to know our guest speaker, who is also a youth leader for agriculture, Mr. Jim Cano, who shared with us the importance of agriculture in food security and learned from his various engagements, his ways to promote agriculture as a youth. He also enjoined us to work together and change the world to a perfect agriculture. Then we had our workshop proper with a theme, Ensuring Food Security Through Sustainable Production and Good Nutrition. The objective of the workshop is to provide the young leaders an appreciation of the farm-to-table activities and their role in responding to the sustainable development goals on ensuring food and nutrition security. We had four modules and I will present the highlights for each module. So for module one, discover Philippines one vegetable at a time. This was presented by the PGR team. They provided us with a glimpse on the importance of conservation of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. We learned the diverse indigenous vegetables grown in the Philippines. And some of you might have seen a couple of these that are familiarly grown in your countries. The PGR team also emphasized the diverse source of food with good nutritional value, hence the importance to conserve 
these valuable genetic resources for food and nutritional security. So we are encouraged to work together and rediscover indigenous ve vegetables in our own countries. For module two, edible landscaping, the artistic technique of crop reduction, the module was started off with a presentation of Dr. Sanchez. He presented edible landscaping as an approach that merges the science of crop reduction and the art of landscaping and garden designing and planning. EL or edible landscaping is an innovative and creative crop production technology. The edible landscaping has four goals, aesthetics, functionality, health and wellness, and self-sufficiency. It, it is based on the EL triangle, which involves the following phases, design, implementation, and maintenance phase. Some practical tips were also shared to us in establishing an edible landscape. We finally learned that with edible landscaping, we can establish an aesthetic and functional spaces for both health and wellness across generations and create sources of safe, sufficient and nutritious food in households and communities. For module three, food safety inside the radar of the SDGs, the IFST team uh, started off their presentation on a discussion on the basics of food safety. We learned five keys to safer food to stop harmful microorganisms and toxic chemicals from making us and other people sick. We also learned that proper food handling is the key to, to foodborne disease prevention and safe food cause millions of illnesses and thousands of deaths. So food can become contaminated at several points along the food's journey from production to consumption. So it is emphasized that food safety is a shared responsibility and involves everybody in the value chain from farm, processing, transportation, storage, distribution to consumption. We are then encouraged to take part to make our food safe. And finally, for module four, eating healthy and sustain sustainably, the IHNF team presented the current status of Philippine nutrition and discussed the PPAN, Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition, which is the country's blueprint for nutrition programs. This reflects somehow the nutrition problems and corresponding strategies employed by other similar countries. The students participated in the escape game, a learning activity on healthy eating. From this activity, we'll learn how to consume healthier food items and apply the principles of healthy eating, which are variety, balance, and moderation. Then Chef Ayan shared with us tips on sustainable preparation and consumption of food. To achieve this, collaborative efforts is necessary across sectors. A shift in the food production landscape depends also on a shift in our diets. More importantly, we are encouraged to share and educate our family and friends on sustainable preparation and consumption. Chef also demonstrated how to cook the national dish of the Philippines adobo. It is interesting to learn the history of this national dish. So for module four, they captured several ways to achieve healthy and sustainable eating. So let's share what we have learned to our family and friends. As a final takeaway on this workshop, we surely learned a lot from natural and nutritious plant genetic resources, how to aesthetically produce our food, importance of food safety, and how we should take part on it and finally, ways on how to achieve healthy and sustainable eating. I hope your minds are filled with nutritious and helpful tips for a healthy and sustainable living. Lastly, for the workshop activity, if you happen to choose workshop five for your main output, you will have to prepare an infographics that will incorporate your learnings on sustainable food production in ensuring a healthier diet. And with this, may I call on Director Aimee Martinez and AVP Wendell Tapili to formally close today's session and to provide some reminders. So let's give them a virtual round of applause. That was indeed a very busy and nutritious day. Don't forget, delicious. But before we end this session, let me award this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Laude 
for all her good work today. This Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Dr. Danette P. Laude, Associate Professor, College of Agriculture and Food Science of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanet. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you very much, everyone, for another exciting day. Thank you, Cluster 5. Marami pong salamat, UP Los Banos, and TVUP for your excellent work. As I always say, UP Los Banos has always done a great job, and I congratulate them again. For it. Let's give UP Los Banos a very warm round of applause. So again, we will see you tomorrow for day six on the role of biodiversity in the resilient development hosted by the College of Science of UP Diliman. Marami pong salamat muli. Keep safe and healthy. Bye-bye.